Welcome everyone. I'm calling the May 18th City Council meeting to order. We are doing a remote meeting tonight and before we move on to tonight's agenda items, I'd like just to acknowledge uh, the remote meeting format. On March 6th, I issued an emergency proclamation declaring a civil emergency in the city due to the COVID-19 outbreak pop-up screens right in the middle of my message. On March 24th, the governor issued Proclamation 20-28, meetings that fall under the Open Public Meetings Act, such as our city council meetings, from being conducted in person. The proclamation has been extended through May 31st. Tonight's meeting will be held entirely remotely. The meeting will be recorded, streamed live, and available for later listening on the city's YouTube channel. Myself, the council, and certain city staff are using our cameras. However, be aware that our meeting platform cannot show all of our videos at one time. Rather, it will focus on the last four to five individuals who spoke. A call-in number was provided on the meeting agenda for members of the public who wish to call in by phone to listen live to the meeting. For our phone-in callers, during staff presentations, staff will make every effort to specify which materials they are referencing so everyone can follow along. Those who provided advance notice are able to make comments under the audience comment portion of the meeting. We also encourage email comments to be sent to the council as well. At this point, we'll take a moment to take a roll call of the council members in attendance. So please stay here when I call your name. Council Member DeMichelle. Here. Council Member Goodman. Here. Council Member Hall. Here. Council President Hunt. Here. Council Member Mark. Here. Deputy Council President Ray. Here. And Council Member Walsh. Here. All present. In addition, the following city staff are participating in tonight's meeting. City Administrator Wally Bobkowitz, Deputy City Administrator Andrea Snyder, City Attorney Jim Haney, City Clerk Tina Eggers, Deputy City Clerk Tisha Geezer, Public Works Operations Director Brett Heath, Economic Development Manager Jen Davis-Hayes, Finance Director Beth Goldberg, Senior Budget Analyst Susie Monsell. Have I missed any staff members, City Clerk? It looks as if we also have HR Director Stephanie Johnson on the line. Thank you for that. For those members of the public on the call, welcome. The Clerk or I will call on you to make comments when we reach that portion of the agenda. So before we begin, I'd like to reiterate the meeting guidelines. For all meeting attendees, Please speak clearly and pause frequently. State your name each time before speaking and mute your microphone when you're not speaking. If you're also streaming the live video feed, please turn the sound off as there is a delay. For council members, please continue to use the Skype meeting messenger to indicate when you wish to speak. Identify yourself before you ask a question, make a motion or second a motion, or participate in a debate. First item on our agenda this evening is the Pledge of Allegiance. So if you will all keep your microphones muted, I do welcome you to join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The next item on the agenda this evening is some special business. Um, we're going to take a few moments to recognize the work and career of Brett Heath, our Public Works Operations Director. Effective June 1st, Brett will be leaving the city of Issaquah, and he is the city's longest serving employee of 42 years. Brett has made a lasting impact on our community, both at City Hall and for our customers and residents. Brett has ensured the safety of our community, mentored countless employees, opened the existing Public Works Operations Shop, developed one of the best emergency preparedness programs in the state, served as incident commander during several emergencies and disasters, and was a member of our city's senior leadership team. And these are only a few of his accomplishments. Brett, I want to thank you for your distinguished service for the city of Issaquah, and I understand that you may have some comments you'd like to share with us tonight. Yes, good evening. Good evening. I just wanted to take this opportunity to say thank you to the mayor and to the city council. And I'd also like to thank past mayors and past city councils for the opportunity to serve the city of Issaquah over the last 42 years. Um, 
I also want to take uh, an opportunity to say a special thanks to Leon Koss for taking a chance on me many years ago. And uh, it's been a great, uh, great opportunity to serve the community. It's been a, a very good experience, and I will certainly miss everyone um, as I move on. So thank you very much for the opportunity to work and serve in Issaquah. Brett, thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure to work with you. I also want to let everybody know that the interim PWO director will be Harvey Walker, and Harvey has been with the city for nearly 13 years and is currently our public works manager of stormwater and sewer operations. Next month, the city will begin recruiting for a new public works director who will lead the efforts to merge two existing departments, engineering and operations. Brett, thank you very much for your service. Next portion of our meeting this evening is audience comments. Uh, I'll be asking the city clerk if anyone has signed up to speak this evening. Yes, we have Ann Fletcher, uh, and I understand you have some guidelines to read, so hold on just a moment, Ann. Thank you. Uh, written comments can be submitted at any time to city council at isquawa.gov. Comments received by email on tonight's agenda items will be acknowledged by Council President Hunt under the corresponding agenda item. Uh, citizen comments are an important part of the public process. We take them seriously and factor them into the decisions we make. Please make sure to direct your comments to the whole council and not individuals. While this is not a question and answer session, we will contact you to follow up if needed. When recognized, please unmute your microphone. State your name, address, and relationship to the city. Speak clearly, pause frequently, limit your comments to five minutes, and remute re your microphone when done. If you do not respond after your name or phone number is called, or if your connection is lost unexpectedly, the meeting will need to proceed. You are encouraged to rejoin the meeting if able. If a speaker is out of order, I will ask them to stop and mute their microphone. And if a speaker does not comply, I may direct staff to mute their microphone. If a disruption to the meeting occurs and order cannot be restored, I may direct staff to remove you from the call. Again, citizen comments, written and verbal, are an important aspect of the public process. The city takes comments seriously, and we thank you for taking the time to address us during our meetings. Um, city Clerk, can you identify the first person who has signed up to speak this evening? Yes, Ann Fletcher. Thank you very much. And if you would like to unmute your microphone, then go ahead. Thank you for coming to the meeting this evening. Can you hear me? We can. Thank you, Ann. Oh, good. Okay. This is Ann Fletcher. I'm a resident at 255 Southeast Andrews Street in Issaquah. And I would like to um, orally share some points from a letter that the People for Climate Action um, already submitted uh, to the City Council. Um, dear City Council members, uh, Issaquah People for Climate Action appreciates the environmental caring and commitment the City has shown despite the intensity of the response that was needed for the pandemic. We are grateful that you have kept in mind the continued need to allocate some resources and to engage community members in addressing climate change. We are currently working with Issaquah Sustainability staff member Megan Curtis Murphy and other community organizations every other week to plan a two-part virtual climate community convening scheduled for July 20th and 30th. We also look forward to a city-sponsored meeting on June 16th for the public to give input on expanding the current Rivers and Streams Board to include all areas of environmental sustainability. In other news, King County held two virtual K4C public input sessions about the toolkit being developed by consultants for use by cities. Several PCA members, at least two council members, and staff member Megan Curtis Murphy attended to learn from the many concerned citizens who attended also, about 70 each session, and to provide perspectives on priorities for the toolkit. The toolkit will be finished, hopefully, by the end of August and sent to the King County Council for approval in September. 
Although the public will not have further direct opportunity for oral input before then, People for Climate Action will be in touch with our city representative who will attend a June 3rd K4C meeting about the toolkit. Mayor Polly and alternate Zach Hall, as well as K4C steering committee member, Megan Curtis Murphy. And we will be encouraging them to make the elected officials meeting very interactive for them and as transparent as possible for the public and to provide a follow-up summary of what was discussed and any action items. On another front, People for Climate Action held a webinar on May 2nd with a focus on building energy efficiency. It included several interesting speakers, and so we provided a link uh, to the webinar recording in the uh, communication to you. To accompany this, the PCA Coalition has published the building section of a list of possible city actions which they've been working on this spring. And it's also attached to the email. By mid-June, PCA Coalition plans to publish the transportation and land use section of this same document. As you may recall, Issaquah's two biggest carbon emission areas are building and transportation, accounting for over 70% of our greenhouse gas production. Cities must take bold action in those two sectors if we are to meet the goals of 50% carbon emission reduction by 2030. And finally, we offered you an important five-minute YouTube video from the Global Council of Mayors, published April 24th. It emphasizes the push by this global alliance of 10,000 mayors for local actions on climate. We hope our representatives will be able to view it before the June 3rd K4C toolkit meeting to see the opportunities we have before us still and to continue the positive partnership that we have begun. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. I just want to check back in with the city clerk and make sure that we only had one person signing up to speak this evening. Yes, that's correct. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Um, and again, just to remind folks, you can also submit comments to the council before the meeting at citycouncilatisquawa.gov. The next item of business this evening is the committee and regional report. So I'd like to call each council member to, um, in order to report out. Council Member Hall. Thank you, Mayor Polly. Um, I have two reports this evening. Um, first, uh, last Thursday, I attended a board meeting for Eastside Fire and Rescue, and I'll let um, either Council Member uh, Goodman or Deputy Council President Ray speak to that meeting. Uh, as I'm just the city's alternate. Um, last Friday, I attended a meeting of the Affordable Housing Committee, and we spent a lot of time talking about COVID-19's uh, impacts on the broader affordable housing world uh, that day. Uh, we discussed short-term emergency measures, long-term challenges, and lessons learned from previous experiences like those from the Great Recession. Uh, and just for some perspective for council and for the community, um, I'm moving my camera over because it keeps moving to the right for some reason. Um, before the COVID-19 crisis, one in three King County households were cost burdened, um, which is 30% of your income um, or more uh, dedicated to housing. And renters were twice as likely to pay half of their incomes on housing. Uh, communities of color were significantly more likely to be paying more than half of their incomes on housing. Um, so very clearly, there is a huge need uh, for housing affordability in our region. And some takeaways from the presentation last Friday were, was that um, cost burden households would rise dramatically. Um, disproportionate impacts like those on communities of color would be amplified. And the need to build and preserve affordable housing is still there and in fact is growing. Um, as each day passes. So um, another thing, another takeaway was that we need to be doing more to connect the silos of housing and human services work together. Um, so as a committee, our chartered responsibilities are somewhat narrow, sometimes frustratingly narrow, um, but we decided that we wanted to take, 
time to focus really on advocating for new policy at the state and federal level um, as well to support the affordable housing need in our region. So that is uh, that work to identify future policy action is happening now. So I'll keep the council and the community um, updated on that work. Um, and that was really just a little bit of what we discussed and I'll be consolidating my notes uh, for city staff this week as I think we discussed a lot of helpful and interesting information that city staff will find interesting and, and helpful as well. Uh, and if anyone, a counselor in the community want to talk um, about this meeting offline, I'm happy to do that too. Um, just let reach out. And um, finally, our next regularly scheduled meeting is scheduled for July 22nd. Thank you. That concludes my report. Thank you, Council Member Hall. Council Member D. Michelle. Uh, thank you, Mary, Mayor Polly. Um, I attended the Healthier Here Governance Board meeting on May the 7th. Um, and at that meeting, they reallocated funding from their training fund to the Community Navigator Fund. The Community Navigator Fund supports services that help non-English speaking residents and citizens to navigate social services, behavioral health, and healthcare systems. This reallocation added 240,000 to the previously reallocated funds of 375,000. Uh, and I took it upon myself to do a little bit of research to find uh, where the closest community navigator is located in our area. It is located uh, ordinarily at Bellevue City Hall. Uh, they offer Spanish and Russian languages and they share the people there one day a week with the Together Center in Redmond. And of course, all services are currently being provided remotely. Uh, it's important to note that the agencies and tribal partners across King County have requested 1.8 million in assistance uh, for the Community Navigator Fund. And so the funds that were allocated by Healthier Here meet only uh, a relatively small part of that need. Um, agencies that offer cultural navigator services, such as those offered at the Together Center, have been severely impacted by the dual pressure of extremely increased need at the same time as fundraising has collapsed. Uh, another highlight at the meeting was that Healthier Here was awarded $1.4 million for the implementation of a Community Information Exchange, or CIE, platform. Again, the goal of this project is to reduce the barriers and silos that characterize a lot of modern medicine and allow different doctors and agencies to share information and integrate mental health services and substance abuse prevention services with health services. The funding for the 1.4 million came from the county's veterans, seniors, and human services funding. Uh, coming up, I will be attending the Eastside Transportation Program tomorrow morning at 9.30. Uh, it's a combined meeting with ETP, Skateboard, and Seashore. Uh, we'll be, be meeting with Metro. And then on Thursday uh, at 9.30 in the morning, I will be meeting with Eastside Human Services Forum um, for the second meeting of this year. That ends my report. Thank you, Council Member D. Michelle. Council Member Walsh. Thank you, um, Mayor Polly. Uh, uh, last Friday, um, City Administrator Wally Bobquitz and I attended the Chamber of Commerce board meeting, um, just trying to stay in touch, trying to understand what our economic development needs are. Um, and because everything is still up in the air, we were just talking a lot about um, this meeting and what our budgetary um, issues look like and making sure that they understood where we were in that conversation. Um, we also talked just a little bit, we had just received notice from King County that some of their CARES Act funding um, was going to be distributed to cities in order to uh, use for economic development. We still don't know what King County, if there are any requirements on who we can give the money to or how we can use it. Um, but we wanted to let the chamber know that we had received notice that that money was going to come and we would keep in touch with them about um, what that means and how we're going to be able to use it. Um, and then the PSRC economic development 
Economic District Development Board, or the other way around, um, has not had a meeting, but they are um, hosting a webinar on Wednesday, which I'm going to attend about CARES Act funding in the region um, and how we might best be able to utilize that. So if I learn anything from it, I'll be able to uh, bring that back. But that concludes my report. Thank you, Council Member Walsh. Council Member Goodman. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Council Member Goodman here. Uh, last Thursday, the East Side Fire and Rescue Board of Directors met, and um, at that meeting, um, we received a couple of briefings from the chief. Um, one was uh, just an update um, or a report out to the board about Eastside Fire and its um, approach to COVID and that its uh, phasing will um, coincide with the governor's phasing process. We also received uh, some budget information, and the uh, Eastside Fire's current expenses related to COVID-19 is about $400,000, and it's costing Eastside Fire $10,000 um, in um, additional costs weekly um, for uh, the COVID response, and that's tied mostly to uh, supplies, the increase in the cost of supplies. Um, and the chief, as everyone, is a little bit concerned about the threat of a second wave of COVID-19 and mitigating those financial impacts. Um, also, the COVID-19 doesn't anything have anything to do with diminishing the potential wildland season threat, and that would be uh, wildfires. And if any events of any significance would take place, that would be a minimum impact of about a million dollars to each side fire. Um, in, with uh, PFAS, um, the Department of Ecology uh, has money for capital funding for that uh, pro um, that project, but that uh, there is the potential that that capital funding could be swept by the governor. Um, Eastside Fire has $250,000 spent on that already, hoping to get reimbursement um, uh, before any sweep of that capital budget could take place, not that it's going to take place, but that is one concern. Um, and the result of that is potentially, possibly suspending the work a little bit. Also, transports are down 20%, which directly impacts revenue due to less people being on the road and also fewer people um, being interested in going to the hospital right now. Eastside Fire has also done some expenditure control they have a hiring freeze and um, right now and vacant positions are frozen. There is a freeze on all non-essential spending and the uh, Eastside Fire has negotiated a memorandum of understanding with the union related to a 12 hour training day and reducing overtime, which will see a $100,000 savings. Um, we talked about Issaquah's request for some contribution concessions and uh, the um, in response to that, um, these are my words, uh, that it appeared as though the board um, took that as an opportunity in light also of the increased expenditures related to COVID um, for Eastside Fire to look at um, revenue increases, potential revenue increases. So the board decided to refer to the Finance and Administrative Committee the task of discussing ambulance fees and any other fees and potential revenue sources that the committee may deem appropriate to discuss and then bring those recommendations back to the board. Uh, that meeting will take place in early June. I don't have the exact date in front of me. And that concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Goodman. Councilmember Martz. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, this is Councilmember Martz speaking. The Sound Cities Association Public Issues Committee met on uh, Wednesday, May 13th at, uh, is that the right date? Uh, yes, Wednesday, May 13th, uh, sorry, at 7 p.m. Uh, there were three COVID-19 related issues that uh, we are either considering or took action on. The first is that uh, we will be considering next month a resolution uh, that states that the Sound Cities Association urges King County and other entities to forgo any increases in rates and fees in light of the COVID-19 public health emergency and the resulting economic impacts 
Um, what I would ask is that my fellow council members take a look at the FCA uh, Sound Cities Association Public Issues Committee packet from May uh, and be prepared to discuss whether uh, we should be supportive of this potential action by the Sound Cities Association uh, at the next. So we should discuss it at the next council meeting for potential action at the next Sound Cities Association meeting, which would be in June. The second issue that I would ask that you take a look at and be prepared to discuss was uh, potentially, uh, basically in preparation for the potential of a special session, the Association of Washington Cities, AWC, adopted legislative priorities related to COVID-19 response and relief. To provide a consistent message to legislators, FCA is considering adopting the same legislative priorities. Mm -hmm. So I will be asking at the next council meeting uh, whether we should consider taking, we should uh, re consider recommending that FCA uh, adopt the same legislative priorities. And then finally, emergency action was taken. Uh, it was a first reading, but uh, a supermajority considered it an emergency and a even stronger supermajority voted for a proclamation of commitment to an inclusive community that rejects stigma and bias related to COVID-19. And I will actually be discussing this further in for the order because uh, a number of cities have taken at the municipal level uh, similar proclamations or made similar proclamations. And I will be discussing uh, with the rest of council and the mayor uh, whether we as a city want to consider doing something similar. So uh, that concludes my report. Thank you, Council Member Martz. Deputy Council President Ray. Thank you, Mayor Pauly. I have no report this evening. Thank you. Council President Hunt. Thank you, Madam Mayor. This is Council President Hunt. The Sal uh, Salmon Recovery Council of RIA 8, which is Water Resource Inventory Area, but it's the technical name for our watershed. Um, the Salmon Recovery Council will meet this Thursday at May 21st um, at 2. And the main um, agenda item will be approval of the work plan and cost share for 2021. And Issaquah's proposed um, cost share is $16,000, $16,085. This reflects a increase based on the consumer price index, CPI slash W, um, from our previous uh, cost share of $15,709. So we will be voting on this as well as on the work plan, which explains what conservation actions and um, salmon recovery actions will be taking place by the Salmon Recovery Council and um, what work will be funded. So if you have any questions about the cost share or anything like that, please do let me know. Um, and if you have concerns, please let me know before we vote on that on Thursday. And that concludes my report. Thank you, Council President Hunt. Next thing on the agenda this evening is the mayor's report. And most of my report has to do with COVID-19 in the city. In, in March of this year, cities and counties reacted quickly to reduce the spread of COVID-19 by adopting physical distancing measures and focusing on readiness to treat those affected by the disease. Now we're in the position to engage our community in a conversation about reopening our community in a phased approach as we learn more about this virus. Earlier this month, I appointed a recovery task force, selecting community members to represent the many important perspectives in Issaquah. This diverse team is comprised of representatives from the city's boards and commissions, as well as some community members at large. They will advise the city on various issues relating to responding to the COVID-19 pandemic and future reopening of city services and programs. The task force will also advise the city on other community initiatives that are important to Issaquah residents and businesses. And the task force will meet regularly through August 2020. However, meetings may be extended beyond this time, depending on the progress of the pandemic response. So far, we've had two meetings. May 7th included introductions, a briefing of our response to date, and the City Hall's new budget realities. May 14th included presentations on economic development from community partners, as well as a brainstorm on the group's work plan moving forward, which will have a focus on community health, economic recovery, community engagement, and more. Our next virtual meeting will be held at 4 p.m. on May 28th. 
and community members can watch live, submit comments to the group ahead of time, or just join us for public comment. Uh, Council Member Walsh had mentioned uh, about some potential funding, COVID funding for businesses, and I thought what I would do is um, talk about what we do know and what we don't know so far in terms of funding that might be available. Our city is experiencing the financial strain from the pandemic response and the resulting impacts to our economy, and we have been working to reduce expenditures to align with a revised revenue forecast, as well as looking for available funding to offset COVID-19 related expenses. The state of Washington has proposed funding to cities, including Issaquah, through the Coronas, Coronavirus Aid, Relief and Economic Security Act, also known as the CARES Act. Issaquah may receive $1.12 million. And at this time, the money can only be spent to cover costs related to COVID-19 crisis and cannot be used to make up for revenue losses. Current guidance appears that the reimbursement guidelines will be very broad, but we're waiting for further details. Additional funding for economic recovery from the federal government is possible, but it remains unknown at this time. There will also be available funding from the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, for costs directly incurred from COVID-19, but specifics are unknown at this time. And I'd like to give a special thanks to King County Council Member Kathy Lambert for directing $5,000 in unrestricted funds to the City of Issaquah. And the City Administration will continue to keep you informed as we know, learn more about the various funding or reimbursements that become available. But right now, there's a lot of unknowns and a lot of uncertainty. Also, tonight, this evening, Finance Director Beth Goldberg will be presenting the City's plan for the second round of expenditure reductions. Round two identifies an additional $1.6 million in general fund underspends, bringing the total underspend from rounds one and two to $6.4 million. Round two also includes plans to address COVID-related financial impacts on the following other funds, on, on the other city funds. Director Goldberg will be providing details in her presentation this evening. We are right now in a monitoring mode, waiting for additional revenue projections from the state and confirming financial assistance from the federal government, FEMA, state, and King County. And at this time, we are not expecting any additional expenditure reductions. And that concludes the mayor's report. The next item on our agenda this evening is informational updates, and we'll be starting with ID 0696, food delivery fees, and I'd like to ask uh, Jen Davis Hayes to unmute. She is our Economic Development Manager, and she's going to have a presentation for Council this evening. Thank you, Madam Mayor, um, and good evening, Council Members. I'm Jen Davis Hayes, I'm the Economic Development Manager. Um, first, I'd like to uh, showcase and ask for forgiveness for wearing a T-shirt <laughs> to today's Council meeting, and hopefully those of you can see it. I just received this in the mail today. It actually says, for those of you who are not able to see this, Issaquah Highlands Stronger Together. And this was um, an Issaquah Highlands Council fundraiser uh, uh, for their organization. And I thought it was a great message to share because all the things we're doing for businesses uh, is about our work with our partners, which helps to make us, make us stronger. So um, we are returning tonight to provide additional information about the restaurant service fee topic and what our efforts to help restaurants, and actually also to hear from Kathy McQuarrie, the Ithaca Chamber CEO. So two weeks ago, we provided some in initial information about the restaurant delivery apps. We have continued to reach out to restaurants, and either the city or our partners have spoken to approximately 50 businesses. The input we received was similar to what we shared with our initial report out that some businesses are not using the food delivery services, some are using them but will only during, do that so during their reduced sales period, and some are using, um, and in general, sorry, in general, businesses would like to pay lower delivery fees, and, but they also mentioned that several services already reduced their fees on a temporary basis. They shared with us there are varied performance for each platform, and some was concerned about the delivery service choices, such as one of the apps waiting for several orders in an area before dispatching a driver, and other factors that can create a negative customer service experience. In the council, member, council agenda memo, we provide some additional information about research from other cities regarding fees. Um, in general, we can't just look up how much a uh, 
food delivery service app charges to restaurants, but there was some research done in other larger cities. In, gen in general, the service delivery apps charge differently according to not only the business model they individually have, but also the area they're serving, the type of restaurant, and the level of services provided. Several cities have already passed caps, while others are exploring it currently. This is a moving target in activities, and uh, the caps are so new that impacts may, be, may not be completely known yet. Most are in larger cities, um, and uh, I spoke to staff in Seattle and Evanston, Illinois, to learn about their experience. I mentioned in the memo that Seattle has had anecdotal stories about not following the rules, and, and they are also exploring exactly how to take enforcement. There is some interest to potentially maintain some regulations on their fees after the state of emergency in Seattle. In Evanston, Illinois, which several council members had asked us to look more into, because their size is smaller than Seattle, but still has a population of about 74,000 people, they have also set a cap during the state of emergency. They have not had any um, pushback from the delivery services, nor reports of providers not following the rules, although they acknowledge the challenge in that they don't get to see the individual receipts. They're also exploring how uh, to actually enforce what kind of mechanism they have, which may be a fine through a general citation. Um, she mentioned that there's an uncertainty if that would deter action or not by the delivery service apps. So the administration has decided not to bring a recommendation to implement a cap on food delivery service fees, instead focusing on promotion, education, and enhanced business support of the restaurants. So this will include education and promotion, um, will include encouraging the public to order directly from restaurants to avoid the food delivery char charges that are, are put on our restaurants. We'll also do promotion of our local restaurants in the regional restaurant map, on the Saving Local website, and other Eat Local messaging. We uh, have allocated $10,000 of our economic development funding to implement a 60-day restaurant marketing campaign. This was an amount that we could reallocate from our port grant funding um, from our business attraction marketing. We believe there's an immediate need for this and plan to take some efforts in June and July. We've had some initial discussions and we'll continue these with our vision partners. That includes the Chamber, the Downtown Issaquah Association, the Visit Issaquah, Gilman Village Merchants, and Issaquah Highlands Council on how to best implement and ways to leverage actions that they have already taken. While we don't have all the details yet, some of those ideas include social me media marketing and some joint marketing efforts with our partners that are already occurring. We'll continue to do outreach to our businesses through one-on-one -on -one calls and roundtables to discuss how they plan to re how and if they plan to reopen in phase two and phase three. So that's at 50% and 75% capacity of their interior dining space and, and learn more about the restaurant needs. In our initial discussions with the restaurants, um, some were not going, planning to open during phase two because of the challenges of opening at a 50% capacity. Um, the, we will also ensure that our, our restaurants and all businesses know about our business assistance resource through Restart Up 425, and that is one-on-one -on -one technical assistance free for business, business owners in Issaquah. And then our partners are also looking at some other efforts, such as bulk um, purchasing of personal protection equipment, PPE. They're looking at a reservation platform through Open Table. Um, how to ease expansion of outdoor eating options. So this may be around per, uh, helping to assist with the permits or allowing expansion into private and public parking lots. Um, and we're also exploring a signage, so everywhere from A-frame signage as well as dedicated curbside pickup spaces. Um, and some of our partners have talked about decals for windows with cohesive messaging. So we recognize the need for signage about being open and we'll explore options. We also need to know, know, we also know that we need to set some boundaries about what's allowed, as we've already heard that there are some business signage miles away from the current business. And so we want to make sure that we have, uh, our community remains, um, uh, beautiful as, as that moves forward. So we'll figure out a good balance on that. Um, at the last council meeting, um, we heard that you'd like to hear directly from the chamber. So I would like to in introduce Kathy McCory, the CEO of the Greater Issaquah Chamber of Commerce, to further speak on this topic. And we'll both be available for questions after she's done. 
Thanks, Jen. Um, before we get Kathy on, are there any, I know I have one question lined up. Um, Council Member Goodman, would you like to wait for the second part of the presentation or was your question for Jen? Um, I can wait until after Kathy McCrory has spoken. Thank you. Thank you. Kathy, go ahead. Okay. And I apologize, I had a dog barking in the background there. Um, thank you, Jen. Uh, good evening, Madam Mayor, City Council. Uh, I pretty much I'm going to echo a lot of uh, Jen's statements. Uh, we do support um, uh, everything that the restaurants first inquired about as far as anything we can do to help them lower their costs. Uh, restaurants traditionally have a very thin margin when it comes to uh, markup, and so we, um, we looked to at what was being done by the delivery services. It is very complicated. Uh, lots of different models are out there. Uh, the things that came to mind for us was um, if you've ever used those apps, they tend to be more regional. Uh, you can pull up Mexican food and you can see Mexican food from uh, Issaquah, from Sammamish, from Bellevue. Um, and so some of the things we were concerned about is if, um, if we set caps on uh, what delivery um, organizations could charge, would that put Issaquah at a disadvantage? Could it have those restaurants show up lower in the rankings? Um, could it delay delivery? As Jen mentioned, would they start bundling delivery for Issaquah so that uh, it takes a little bit longer? And the one thing we want to make sure that doesn't happen for our restaurants is that their reputations would suffer during any of this. Um, what we also noticed was that, you know, free market was already taking hold in some cases. We saw DoorDash uh, lower their fees right away and cap theirs at 15%. And so we're hoping that others do follow suit. We realize some have, um, and there are a few holdouts, of, of course. But again, if it were more regional in its application, to include Sammamish, Bellevue, et cetera, I think it would be uh, more um, equitable to all the restaurants. So when we mentioned unintended consequences in our letter, those were some of our concerns. We want to make sure that Issaquah, repu um, Issaquah restaurant reputations um, remain solid um, and that there would be no unintended Tended consequences and lack of service in lowering their uh, where they appear on the listing of restaurants, etc. Uh, some of the other things um, were um, that we talked about were the educational proponents, and again, Jen touched on this. Uh, anything you know, uh, anything that the chamber can do uh, to help the city, to help the restaurants, um, share messaging. Um, Restaurants, a lot of times, they have great specials that they're offering on their websites that might not be available through delivery services. So can we do something in that respect to help draw, make uh, residents aware of the fact that maybe they want to go to the websites first, they want to look at the options that they have, even from the standpoint of the money they can save ordering directly from the restaurant and doing takeout or less expensive options that the uh, that the restaurants might have available. We realize that everyone has their favorite app per se, but we think that there's a lot that we could do together to educate local restaurants and um, in particular our residents about their options and how they could actually uh, uh, eat out more often for less. Um, with that, um, I just want to say that we will support any and all decisions made by the City Council regarding uh, the restaurant um, delivery fees. We support our restaurants as we do all of the businesses in the community, and we're here to help. And thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Kathy. Jen, did you have any closing comments? Um, no, that was it. I just look forward to your questions, Council members. Okay, we will move to Council Member Goodman. Uh, thank you, Council Member Goodman here. Um, thank you, uh, Kathy, for coming to our meeting and presenting information, and Jen, for your information as well. So the materials, and, and Jen talked about the allocation of $10,000 
of Economic Development Program funding to implement a 60-day restaurant marketing campaign. Um, and I, I'm a little bit um, concerned not about supporting restaurants with this, but about the other um, um, segments of our um, retail and commercial businesses who are also that are also hurting. And so um, setting out to help one segment of that um, of the business community at this time um, seems to set us up for other segments also asking us for help. And so um, I wanted to, and I did have a brief conversation with um, um, Administrator Bob Kowitz today and um, who gave me the impression that this was not going to be strictly about restaurants. So I'm looking for information that would make me feel comfortable that um, we're not, it looks as though we're, you know, we're focused on one segment of the business community, which has me concerned. You know, hotels are, you know, really hurting as well. And so what are we going to be doing to help them out with, um, with money later, um, because I think that's the expectation that we're setting up. So that's sort of my question. I'm looking for um, information about how this is not just focused on one segment, or if it is what we're prepared to do to respond to that future request. Thanks. Great question. Thank you, Council Member Goodman. Um, you know, again, we believe that there's an immediate need, um, uh, an urgent need with our restaurants right now that are open. Um, as Council Member Walsh mentioned, there is um, some allocation of CARES Act funding that for from King County to the city that, again, we don't know the exact uh, rules and regulations on how to use, but that is an available resource to help market more broadly in the future. We completely anticipate that our future uh, economic de development efforts will be about uh, a buy local and a welcome back uh, in a more local tourism way. So check out the, the uh, your attractions in your own community. Um, and so we ha do have partners, again, so we will have some resources um, from the CARES Act and also from our port grant so that has uh, not been allocated to other resources. And um, we have our Visit Issaquah and our Chamber and our Downtown Issaquah Association that also have resources to help amplify and leverage that those messages for uh, buying local uh, for all businesses in Issaquah. Councilmember Goodman, does that answer your question? Um, uh, well, let me, maybe yes and maybe no. Uh, I think it answers, maybe answers my question, but I don't know that it allays my concerns. So it looks like we are spending $10,000 now focused on restaurants and that we are um, expecting to allocate other money in the future to help um, other business segments. Is that accurate? So it is going to be a buy local, eat local kind of effort in the beginning, but the buy local will be an ongoing effort. I don't know exactly if we're going to allocate a certain amount of dollars towards marketing in the future, but we do anticipate that a buy local and recreate local is going to be in our future efforts. So I see that uh, uh, City Administrator um, Bob Gwitz may have a comment on this as well. Okay. City Administrator? Yes, uh, Madam Mayor, Council Member Goodman. Uh, I think it's fair to say there will be additional requests for spending to support the business community. Uh, as I think Ms. Davis Hayes said, we see this as a first step. Uh, the restaurants are sort of leading into this uh, as the first uh, large business segment in the community. Uh, I think by having this be a shop, dine, local event, there will be some opportunities to leverage that investment with other industries. Uh, but it's clear that we're going to have to have a discussion, I think, at some later point about the hospitality industry. We, we collect the lodging tax money. There is some fund balance there. I think it would be natural to talk about that. Uh, we have a large performing arts organization in the Village Theater. Um, we have been talking about them because of the enormous economic impact uh, they have on our community, the number of individuals they bring uh, to Issaquah every year. So I think there will be other discussions. Uh, but our intent is to use this initial funding to partner with our vision partners um, to uh, focus on shop, dine local, and we'll keep you posted uh, on our good progress. 
Thank you. Councilmember Goodman? Thank you. Before we go on, I should have gone to Council President Hunt before we started our questions and comments. And Councilmember Hunt, do you have any items from the public that you received in the way of comments to City Council that you would like to report out on? Um, thank you. Yes, this is Council President Hunt, and we did receive some emails, um, so I will summarize them as best I can. Um, so we received the email from Steve Pereira on this ID, and he um, wrote that he did not support taking action on the delivery fees, and he also opposed the city of Issaquah entering into the $10,000 marketing campaign for restaurants that's described in the ID. Additionally, Connie Marsh wrote to us, that um, restaurants run on volume with narrow margins, and she felt that restaurants currently have far larger problems than delivery fees. And she wrote to us with a number of solutions focusing on promotion of businesses. That's, that Thank concludes you. the correspondence. Thank you, Council President Hunt. So in my list of those wishing to um, have ask questions or have comments, you are next up, Council President, followed by Council Member Hall, and then Council Member Marks. So Council President Hunt. Thank you. This is Council President Hunt. I have a question regarding the $10,000 um, uh, marketing also. So it was mentioned in your presentation that this is from the um, court of Seattle grants, and so I wondered if you could give us an overview of what we would not be doing with that. Um, and then additionally, is the 60 days, is that so that we would be able to prepare for the phase two, or how does that timing line up with phase two? Thank you, Council President Vic, uh, Hunt. Um, so the $10,000, um, from the Fort Grant it would be from our business uh, attraction marketing uh, component that we had that bucket for. And again, we've been in, in communication with our Port of Seattle partners about reallocating and how to, uh, they have given us the message loud and clear to work on business retention efforts. And so that's come from the Port Commissioners down to the staff. So this uh, fits in and aligns with their, their goal. So that is not a problem to reallocate these funding. And then the 60 days, it's um, really meant to, again, more of an immediate, uh, urgent need in the next, and in, in, you know, June and July, give it some time to uh, ramp or to develop in more detail the marketing campaign. And to really, again, at the times when people are starting to get back out and thinking about um, eating and shopping and, and to really encourage people to do that locally. So um, there's no magic number. I think it's, uh, again, um, the amount of money will, will may, may not buy a large media buy, so having it more focused and um, over 60 days seemed to make sense, but it's not set in stone. But we wanted to also be able to make an impact and uh, come back to the council with that those results. Okay, um, that would be great to know at a future time what those results will be and what that discussion would look like. And then my second question is about, um, you mentioned um, in the memo about the outdoor seating requirements, and then also in your presentation, you talked about the signage and um, I believe the permitting on signage and other things and that we might do. Um, and so I wondered which of these potential actions do we um, expect will take council action? And then what will the timeline be for that? And again, I'm trying to be conscious of the phase two and restaurants trying to know what they're going to actually be able to do when they reopen and if they're going to be able to reopen and all of the uncertainty. So if we could get certainty on our timeline, that would that's the con context of my question. Great. Yes, I appreciate that because uh, timing is of the essence. So um, we actually are partners in the Downtown Isco Association and the Isco Highlands Council are currently reaching out to restaurants and also talking to their other other businesses about um, curbside parking and also signage needs. So one of the things uh, we need to, the idea of curbside parking or pick up parking spaces and allocating those, whether they're, uh, some of those spaces are in private lots, so that's not as in our, in our bailiwick, but um, in the downtown, we definitely own the parking behind some of those businesses and along, along, along the street frontage. Um, the idea 
is at a higher level is a great idea. We need to make sure that we allocate those, or we look at uh, those spaces in a way that works for businesses and, and is not two blocks away from where they may deliver that. So those things um, may not need council action. Um, I believe then the other parts about the permitting around the signage and um, the um, um, outdoors or eating would p potentially be about around permitting, as that would be under the uh, community development community services uh, director's um, ability to to uh, proceed with that. So I don't anticipate any uh, initial council needs or actions for that. But as we start to dive into the code and, and hear what those ask, specific asks are, um, there may be some nuances we need to explore. Thank you. City Administrator Bob Chris, you had some information you wanted to add here. Yes, uh, Madam Mayor, Council President Hunt. We plan to come back to the Council at uh, the first study session you're going to be having on Tuesday, June 9th, and we should have answers to many of those questions. We, we see this as a very urgent matter. Uh, the uh, Mayor's Recovery Task Force spent a lot of time uh, speaking about these issues on Thursday, heard presentations from the Chamber, from uh, uh, from that type of business association with some very specific asks. And so we would like to process those and bring those to the council in the study session format on June 9th. And if there are specific actions for the council, then to bring them back to your next regular meeting the following week. Thank you, Administrator Bob Quitz. And in case council members have not all been able to view or see a summary of those recovery task force meetings, we may be trying to do things through the next nine months, 12 months, just to help businesses uh, be able to get their feedback on the ground. And some of them may be that we are waiving um, a fee. So they still are required to have insurance and do all the rest of it, but whatever we can do um, to help them be more successful. So there's, there's a laundry list of items. So thank you for bringing that up, City Administrator. Um, Council President Hunt, did you have any additional questions? No, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Hall with a question. Thank you, Mayor Paula. Yeah, I have a quick question. Uh, and thank you to Jen and thank you to Kathy for the great presentation. I appreciate all the deep work you did there. Um, when I was going through this list of next steps that you have nicely laid out in our agenda packet, I um, tried to go through it with a focus on different things, first on you know business assistance, and then second, um, more broadly on public health. And I noticed that there were two um, two next steps that I really appreciated, you know, ensuring that, you know, when we're do when we are opening up, we're doing it in a right way. We're doing it in a way that um, um, are going to keep people healthy um, and ensure that we don't have an, you know, resurgence and in infections. So I was hoping you could speak a little more in detail about two that I was particularly interested in. Um, the first bullet point of the second batch, which, which was out, oh no, sorry, not that one. Uh, the one that says discuss operations with restaurants regarding 50% and 75% reopening. So that phase two and phase three, you know, what really should that look like? And I know we're going to be getting, you know, guidance from the governor um, about what that looks like, but I'd be curious what um, Jen, you know, what you're thinking and Kathy, what you're hearing from the business community about, about that too from the ground up. And then also that last one about coordinating supply chain uh, and other efforts to provide PPE to restaurants and other retail um, businesses. I was really interested about those two points. So if you could discuss that, that'd be great. Um, I'll ask uh, Kathy to start off because she actually is involved in both of those um, and more so for the second one. So then I'll fill in anything else. Thank you, Jen. Um, so so uh, regarding the PPE, I think one of the things we're looking at is uh, finding out if we can find resources that, for instance, the um, chamber has some accounts that we use um, primarily for salmon days, but could we get them, um, could, for instance, maybe the chamber be the, um, the, the clearinghouse so that we could purchase larger orders, saving money, um, combining um, our resources together to give us greater uh, buying power. Um, uh, uh, there's also an effort by DIA to have masks donated so that the businesses downtown can get free masks 
And we think we could probably all do a little bit more of that, the Highlands, the Chamber, and DIA. But I think most of our um, efforts were really around um, trying to get those group buy-ins so that we could lo truly lower the cost of what everyone's having to pay, um, maybe even taking advantage of some of those um, uh, deals that a lot of the um, distilleries that have switched over to making hand sanitizer and they're giving away a certain amounts, you know, finding those and seeing if we can make runs for um, uh, multiple businesses at the same time and if some of those distilleries would allow us to do that on their behalf, things like that. And I'm sorry, Zach, could you refresh my memory on your first question? It was the safety issue. Sure. Yeah. Thanks, Kathy. Yeah. Kind of everything under the umbrella of, you know, public safety and public health. So one in particular was discussing, you know, what is operation for restaurants and retail businesses going to look like in phase two and phase three? And, and how do we do that safely? Because, you know, I, I know a few business owners here in Issaquah and um, I think the in the community, the um, misconception is everyone is chomping at the bit to just reopen regardless of what public health is. They just want to reopen. But everyone that I talk to who are business owners are like, no, we got to keep people healthy. Otherwise, we don't have customers. So yeah. it seems to me like our community gets it. So I was just interested in, in, from your perspective, what's the conversation like about, well, what is phase two and phase three going to look like? And maybe that's just beginning. No, and it is just beginning. You, that is correct. Um, there's, um, there's a true concern from the restaurant standpoint about, the actual affordability of being able to open in phase two at all. You know, 50% capacity on our smaller restaurants um, isn't, you know, they do the math, they're trying to figure out, is it worth the expense of bringing back the staff if they can only serve so many people in an evening? So what we're anticipating is some businesses will reopen at 50% capacity in phase two. Some might choose to wait till phase three. Some might even wait and choose to not open until phase four when they can bring back 100% capacity. So they have those options. And um, yes, indeed, safety does come first. Um, they do have, they've gotten behind the ordering online and doing takeout, so they have that. Um, and uh, now it's just a matter of that next economic portion on top of keeping people safe. Does it, can they afford to open at 50% capacity? That's great. Thank you, Kathy. Um, and I, I think she hit the nail on the head, um, what we've been hearing as well with restaurants. And so the phase two uh, restaurant guidelines are already out, so they have been looking at them. Um, and they're still uh, they're still being adjusted. So, for instance, the governor has changed about the logging of customers for for restaurants. So, um, as they continue to look at that and figure out what makes sense for their individual floor plate um, and their operations, you know, they will make the decision. Um, and they want to keep their employees healthy as well. And so, having an additional exposure to people at this time is a concern. Um, and so, I think again, we'll be working with the chamber as a held. Um, restaurant and retail and other t uh, industry type roundtables. The Downtown Issaquah Association is having around ha holding roundtables as well with their businesses. So this is how we'll learn about um, what the needs for the individual businesses are beyond our one-on-one -on -one contacts with them. Thank you. Council Member Hall, satisfied? Yeah, that was great. Thank you so much for all that great information. I, and I love the emphasis, Kathy, behind, you know, greater we are and, you know, the support from everyone, we're better and, and um, working together to get people the protective equipment they need and hand sanitizer, dot, dot, dot. So thank you for all your great work. That was great. Uh, next question or comment is coming from Council Member Martz. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, actually, first a question. Um, are, is the administration, I sort of thought when we started this, conversation the administration was looking for feedback now but it sounds like you're more looking for feedback at the study session let me have uh, city administrator Bob Kowitz come back on city administrator yes madam mayor council member Mart. you know this is an evolving issue uh, we want to give you the 
benefit of the information that we have tonight. We certainly are interested in getting feedback from you. We've gotten a, a pretty long list of uh, items from the council, from the recovery task force, from businesses. Uh, we want to keep the ball rolling, and so we're going to come back in a couple of weeks uh, with some more details. But certainly anything you have to contribute uh, this evening is very welcome. Our bottom line is we have a business community that needs help, and we want to be as focused as we can to provide that assistance. Councilmember, right. would you like to comment or have a question or both? Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll comment. First of all, I want to thank Jen Davis Hayes and the city staff. This was a, a lot of really good, informative, uh, <laughs> informative information, which is a redundancy, uh, but uh, really helps me understand uh, the feedback from a number of restaurants. Helps kind of uh, move it beyond just anecdotal. Um, so that was ex extremely helpful. Um, yeah, this is this is help for restaurants in particular. And yeah, perhaps we'll get asked to help other businesses. Good. Uh, if it's good help, uh, if it's not just um, throwing money at a problem, you know, I've heard about some cities that are doing vouchers for local businesses. That's an example of just kind of handing out money. Uh, but this isn't. This seems to be a smart, small use of uniquely city function, things the city can do that other entities uh, can't do as well in terms of getting information out to the public. Uh, so it seems like a, a really, really smart use of a small, dedicated amount of money. Um, you know, our restaurants are, as already mentioned, low margin. A lot of them are run by families. You know, they're going to be under the same regulations as everybody else. If somebody's exposed to coronavirus, they're going to have to self-quarantine. Um, that could have a that could have a, a terrible effect on a small family-run restaurant. Uh, many of our small restaurants in Issaquah are really unique and part of uh, the essential charms that make our city. Um, they're also most of them are not uh, big chains that can afford to you know, amortize the cost out over a large number of, of restaurants. So for all those reasons, I think taking a small focused amount of money and doing things the city does uniquely well uh, is really smart and a great suggestion by the part of the city. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Martz. I have Councilmember Goodman up next with a question followed by Councilmember DeMichelle. Um, I'm happy to let Councilmember DeMichelle go first since I've already had a question. That is very nice. Councilmember Member Michelle, question and a comment, perhaps. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Council Member Goodman. Um, so as a frequent user of DoorDash, um, I have observed how many people um, are working as delivery people. And I, I think I raised this la last time as well. Uh, I, and maybe Kathy McQuarrie has some insights into this. But as we have so many people unemployed, and uh, I'm sure that for some, being a delivery person for uh, the, the food delivery uh, industry is a lifeline that they wouldn't have otherwise have. Do we have any insight into how many uh, people in Issaquah are employed uh, by these services? Um, and uh, are you working with um, people in the so-called gig economy to uh, help support people who are out of work and um, and as we ease into reopening, uh, is that playing a role in the plans that you're making? Thank you. Kathy McCrory. Still getting used to my unmute button. I apologize for the delay. Uh, I do not know exactly how many are employed in that field in Issaquah. Uh, so my apologies, Councilman DeMichelle. I do not have that information. I can tell you, though, what we ha have done and will continue to do is in our um, COVID-19 pages, there's actually a jobs page now uh, that we post who's hiring and companies like that are listed. So uh, um, we're not concerned with uh, who's a member, who's not a member. We're concerned with who needs help. 
And so in that, um, uh, those delivery companies, as we find the, the websites um, and we can drive people to them, because you're right, in a gig economy, many um, delivery people do have other jobs or multiple even deliveries that they will deliver for DoorDash and Grubhub and et cetera. So um, we do continue to pay attention to that, um, but I, I just don't have all the answers to your questions at this time. And I'll just add that yeah, we, we aren't tracking uh, the number of people that are working for in the gig economy in Issaquah as far as residents. Um, and we also on our city webpage uh, for the COVID-19 have listings for jobs um, and also linking to WorkSource and other resources for jobs. We uh, were planning to have our annual job fair on May 12th. Uh, we did cancel that and postpone it. Uh, we have it tentatively scheduled in, in August, but we're also looking at virtual options. So we'll determine um, closer to the time if, if a in-person job fair makes sense or we'll continue to kind of do some virtual uh, uh, connections to the chamber and other organizations to make sure that people can get jobs in Issaquah and the businesses have the resources. Because as Kathy mentioned in the recovery task force last week, um, there's some businesses who are you may think they're not doing well, but beyond um, restaurants that are open and actually uh, are hiring people. So um, we want to make sure that we help support all the businesses that are in need of, of additional uh, employees uh, throughout the community. And I, I appreciate the fact that those are difficult numbers to come by, and I appreciate uh, your input. Thank you. Thank you for the question, Councilmember D. Michelle. It was something that the Issaquah Recovery Task Force also felt it was a highly appropriate thing for city resources partnering with the chamber to do, connect people with available jobs. So that was a great question. Um, Councilmember Goodman. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Councilmember Goodman here. Um, I don't think I've heard an answer to this, and if I missed it, I apologize. But my question is, how do we – with this money, um, how do we define success? What does success look like? Um, what are we, I, I, I'm not, um, I, I think I know what we're trying to achieve and I'm certainly not opposed to it. I just opposed to it. I just wanna, I'm just trying to understand what success looks like and then how do we monitor that and how do we measure it? Um, when we had the rental assistance discussion, we had, uh, there was a lot of talk about the parameters and the requirements, and uh, there seems to be unanimous agreement here that this is just the first um, financial help for the business community. Um, so I want to make sure that we get off on the right foot and um, agreed that we don't want to, with Council Member um, Mart's comment, that we just want, don't want to throw money at projects. We want to make sure that we are actually um, – uh, using it for good, and I realize it's for good, but I also want to make sure that we are um, we are successful in what we're trying to achieve. Thank you. Thank Great you. point. Yes, I mean we take we take our public dollars as serious as as you do, and um, making sure that we're not wasting them. And I will say that we don't have all those answers right tonight, and so we will again. We're going to be coming back to the June study session, we'll have more details. So it really will depend on if we end up leveraging some of these resources with programs that exist already, marketing programs with our partners. So it could be um, if we do some social media marketing, we'll have exact uh, numbers of, of click-throughs and uh, other metrics through the social media uh, platform we use. Um, it could be uh, surveying restaurants. Um, again, I don't want to commit to anything right now until we have more details of exactly what we'll do and then base those metrics off of that, but completely agree that we want to be able to come back because we will also need to report this to the port. So this is, a, this is important from on many and many levels, but also to our funders who to make sure that we're, we can show them that, that we've done um, good things with their money and not just spend it willy nilly. Thank you. And I think that we um, could probably make a pretty quick pivot to not simply restaurants because we also have retailers who are now able to offer curbside, curbside pickup. Mm -hmm. Anyway, thank you very much, everybody. I really appreciate it. City Administrator Bob Quitz, you want to add some more additional information? Yeah, just to follow up uh, what uh, Jen said, 
you know, the metrics piece are going to, is going to be really important. Right now we have one economic development staff member. Uh, we hope that with the item later on the agenda tonight, uh, we're going to be able to have a second economic development staff member. Uh, and I think our goal working with uh, a new staff member in our finance department as we look at performance measures, another item that we would like to talk about at your uh, June study session is what metrics can we be uh, putting in place for the entire ISPA economy? How can we measure jobs, uh, businesses in place, uh, I think business license revenue, B&O you know, tax revenue that comes in. So I think there's lots of ways to measure success and uh, it's clear that we need to have multiple measures for not only this initiative that we're proposing this evening, but uh, I'm sure other initiatives. Again, listening to the conversation the other day at the Recovery Task Force, you know, they certainly believe that you know, a very comprehensive way of looking at economic recovery is a real key piece of this, and so we need to measure that. So we'll come back uh, at the June meeting and talk a little bit more about uh, economy-wide measures within this spot. Thank you, City Administrator Bob Quist. Thank you, uh, Council Member Goodman, for the question. Uh, we do want to make sure we're getting the outcomes and we are using the money effectively and efficiently. I am not seeing any additional questions on this item. I will wait a second or two to see if I have missed anybody. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Jen. Uh, we are going to move on to the next item, uh, ID 0691, COVID Response. Round two budget plan, and I'd like to ask Finance Director Beth Goldberg to make the presentation. Beth. Good evening, everyone. Um, if Tisha could uh, post the PowerPoint on the screen, that would be terrific. There we go. Okay, so uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, we are here tonight to present uh, the round two budget plan in response to uh, the COVID crisis. And uh, Tish, if you can go to the next slide, please. So the purpose of uh, tonight's presentation, uh, Mayor Polly spoke of this a little bit earlier, is uh, to provide an update of the, the next round of our work to uh, respond to the general fund budget shortfall that we uh, spoke about first starting in April, and then also starting to look at the other funds that we are anticipating to have uh, some financial difficulty as a result of COVID. Uh, and then also to provide you a preview of uh, the round three work as well as other next steps. So, Tisha, if you can move to the next slide, please. So, uh, just by way of background uh, and to remind uh, everyone, we projected a $10 million decline in general fund revenues as a result of the COVID emergency. Uh, during round one, uh, which was April 20th, oops, screen went blank. Um, there it goes. Okay. Uh, during round one, we identified nearly uh, – $5 million in underspend plans uh, that included 22 layoffs and freezing 15 vacant positions. Uh, at that meeting, we uh, indicated that we would be reporting back with a round two plan, uh, which is the intention of tonight's presentation. Bishop, you can move to the next slide, please. So uh, just a brief reminder, and we went over this uh, at the April 20th council meeting, um, in terms of roles and responsibilities, the ability to underspend a budget, which is what this plan is, rests with the mayor. Um, but there are certain elements of this plan, as was the case with round one, that uh, we will be seeking council action for. So. Uh, the last meeting, it was primarily uh, changes to personnel policies. Um, tonight, uh, in addition to some personnel policy changes on the consent agenda, we will also be asking council to uh, adopt some changes to our inner fund transfers. And you'll hear me speak about that throughout the meeting or throughout this presentation. And then there's a, a regular business item uh, that covers this later uh, on tonight's agenda. Tisha, if you can go to the next slide, please. 
So um, as a reminder um, of where we are um, and the results of, um, of the work that we have done, we started on April 6th with the $10 million uh, shortfall that uh, I mentioned earlier. Uh, during round one, we identified roughly $5 million, $4.8 million worth of underspend plans. That left a remaining shortfall of uh, roughly $5.2 million. Uh, tonight's plans that I will talk about momentarily uh, identify another $1.6 million of underspend, uh, leaving the remaining shortfall to uh, $3.6 million. So if we can go to the next slide, please. So now I want to talk about a summary of how we got to the $1.6 million uh, worth of reductions or underspend that we're talking about tonight. Uh, the first is uh, we identified uh, in doing a little bit more work on the round one savings that we identified, we've identified another $300 and nearly $80,000 worth of savings. Um, you'll recall at the last meeting that we talked about uh, leave cash outs for the departed employees. We allocated those at that meeting entirely to the general fund. However, some of those positions were funded in some of our other funds. So that uh, reduced the hit to the general fund. So that's one source of the savings. We also uh, have run some calculations on um, how the uh, furloughs uh, and salary reductions that we identified in round one will lower our employer taxes. So that's also captured in here. And then some other fine tuning. Another element of round two was we did a thorough review of our IT functions and IT costs in particular that um, are borne by the general fund, but also some for other funds. And the results of that work, um, and I'll go into more of these details later, uh, total $304,000. So I had mentioned uh, in the, I think, two slides ago about how um, the actions to adjust interfund transfers are going to require council action. So the concept behind this is that uh, this IT savings that we've identified here will accrue to the IT fund, but in order for the general fund to reap the benefit of it, that's where the revenue hit is, we need to lower the amount of money we're transferring to the IT fund. So this is one of uh, the changes that will require council action through uh, an interfund transfer. Similarly, the general fund makes um, a sizable contribution to the street operating fund. So we've identified reductions there. I will go through those momentarily that uh, will reduce the transfer by 711,000. And then last, um, we've identified nearly 214,000 of additional labor savings from uh, furloughs and some of our retirement contributions, uh, thanks to some concessions made by our AFSCME labor union. And the administration wants to extend our thanks uh, to that union um, for um, helping us address these financial challenges. Uh, the administration is continuing to negotiate with the Teamsters and IPSA for um, additional concessions. Um, and if we are successful in those negotiations, we will report back to the council. So if we can move to uh, the next slide, please. So um, uh, Mayor Polly spoke of this earlier in the evening. Uh, we are anticipating that we will receive some CARES Act funding through the state of Washington. Uh, we believe this will total uh, roughly $1.2 million. Um, we are expecting application materials sometime this week. Um, we um, have not allocated this fund, these funds as part of the round two plan. Um, but when we have more information about the receipt of these funds, um, we will be reporting back to the council and some options uh, for this funding. Um, it could help us uh, offset some of the remaining gap. Um, while the funds cannot be used for um, to offset the revenue hit that we are experiencing, they can help offset some of the costs that we are incurring as part of our day-to-day -day work these days in response to the COVID emergency. So that's one option. The other option or a combination thereof would be to offset any unforeseen COVID-related costs 
that the city anticipates in the future. So if we can move to the next slide, please. Um, so um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the other funds, but at first, maybe I want to touch on um, some of the other steps the administration is taking to identify um, additional savings. Uh, so we're continuing, and uh, Councilmember Goodman uh, spoke of this in her comments in the, at the beginning of the meeting. We're continuing discussions with EFER about whether there are any opportunities to reduce our uh, contractual costs with them. We're also, as I mentioned, continuing discussions with our labor unions, and there may be additional uh, opportunities for CARES Act money through the county, and um, there's also talk, um, although there is not bipartisan support for this, so um, a little bit of skepticism, but there's talk that uh, perhaps Congress in their next relief package may offer um, some funding to state and local governments that are struggling right now. So um, on to the other funds. Uh, so when we provided the, the financial forecast on April 6th, we did touch on very briefly, the work at that point had been very preliminary, that we were anticipating some of our other funds uh, were gonna feel the pinch from uh, the economic downturn. And we committed to reporting back uh, on plans for how we would address those challenges. So we've identified six funds uh, that we um, believe will be facing financial challenges as a result of COVID. And that includes the street operating fund. And I'm gonna go into more details of each of these throughout the presentation. The street operating fund, the uh, real estate excise tax fund, our school zone safety fund, municipal arts fund, our IT fund, not because they're facing direct revenue challenges, but because they support functions um, in funds that are facing challenges. And then last, uh, the lodging tax fund. Uh, I want to point out that uh, we are not talking about some of our other larger funds, such as the utility funds, because we're not anticipating at this time that they're going to experience significant, significant COVID-related financial impact. So if we can move to the next slide, please. So first I wanna talk about the street operating fund. So the street operating fund derives 97% of its revenues from sources that are forecast to decline as a result of COVID-19. Uh, the first uh, revenue um, listed on this slide is the motor vehicle fuel tax. So under the stay-at-home orders, people are driving less. So we are expecting that this revenue is going to contract. Um, similarly, general fund, we've talked about that at length. Um, when we allocated reduction targets, um, we're anticipating a 20% shortfall in general fund, but because some functions couldn't take as steep of cuts, some were given 30% targets, which is um, what's reflected here. Uh, and then REIT, which I will talk about uh, in a little bit, we're forecasting a 20% reduction in that revenue. Um, so this was our starting point. Um, basically needed to come up with a plan that would close a $1.2 million shortfall in the street operating fund as a result of these three revenue sources contracting. So if we could uh, move to the next slide, please. So in terms of uh, what we have identified to bring uh, the street operating fund into balance, uh, we're freezing uh, two vacant positions, a senior engineer position and a construction technician, technician position. Uh, staff, as was the case in the general fund, uh, will be furloughing and uh, we're also capturing savings for the uh, 457 retirement account contributions. Uh, like um, other departments, uh, the street operating fund is reducing miscellaneous operating accounts. Um, that includes like travel and training, things of that nature. The uh, review of uh, the work plan and our professional services contract has resulted in some changes in some of our professional services expenditures some deferral of uh, repairs and maintenance. And then uh, as the mayor acknowledged at the outset of this meeting, 
uh, with uh, the retirement of our Public Works Operations Director, uh, the city is looking at this as an opportunity to consolidate our Public Works Engineering Departments and our Public Works Operations Department into a single department. So um, all of these, um, these changes accumulated some savings, but not enough to close the $1.2 million gap that I spoke about on the earlier slide. Um, maintaining funding for our street operating functions is a high priority. Um, and so as a result of that, we actually, and I'll talk about this a little bit uh, later in tonight's presentation, but um, as part of this, uh, we made some deeper cuts into some of the capital investments that were um, planned for the REIT fund so that we could increase the amount of REIT that we're transferring from the REIT fund into the street operating fund. So if we can go to the next slide, please. So uh, now for uh, the real estate excise tax. So um, by way of background, this is a notoriously volatile revenue source. This is a revenue source our revenue that is derived um, by a, a, a small assessment on the sale of uh, real estate in the city of Issaquah. Um, and it has been a healthy source of revenue of late, but uh, during the Great Recession, this revenue source declined by 55%. So um, that's, that's kind of a peg um, in which to think about this. Um, so far, the data on how the real estate market is holding up has been a little bit mixed. Um, there, there was certainly a drop in March, but there is some indication in April that things were picking up again. Um, certainly not to um, the pre-COVID levels, but um, indicating some level of strength in the real estate market. So for the purposes of this exercise, we're assuming uh, a modest 20% reduction in these revenues. So part of it is um, because of uncertainty about how this is going to impact the real estate market. Some of this also is driven. You will notice that these that REIT has a very healthy fund balance. So that provides us a little bit more cushion um, to respond if revenues deteriorate beyond 20%. We will have um, some resources to fall back on. So um, if we can move to the next slide, I will then talk about um, uh, some of the changes that we have made uh, in our REIT um, plans. So um, on this slide um, lists a number of uh, transfers made from the REIT, uh, the REIT fund to other city funds to complete various primarily capital or one-time investment costs. So we're making a series of, of uh, reductions, meaning um, uh, we will spend less on the particular project or some deferrals of uh, various investments. So what you will see on this slide is most of these numbers are negatives, except uh, for under the street operating fund, which is displayed in the upper uh, right-hand corner of the table on the screen you will notice an increase to the street operating fund of $458,000. And that is because as we looked at the street operating fund and the reductions we felt we can make there, or the underspend we can make there, we did not feel like we could cut any deeper. So um, we're cutting um, a little bit more deeply on the capital plans on REIT so that we can uh, bolster the investment to uh, the REIT fund. Um, just also another note on this, um, in deferring um, or reducing the capital investments, um, it's, it's providing some protection for us. The city of Issaquah is unique in that it uses the, the real estate excise tax fund to support ongoing operating costs. This is fairly unusual. Most jurisdictions rely on this fund because of its volatility. Um, solely for capital investments and one-time investments because it's easier to adjust um, if the real estate market um, contracts and this revenue goes down. Um, so one of the reasons to defer some of these capital projects is to position us so that we can um, have those fund balances remaining to allow us to sustain those ongoing operating costs if this revenue deteriorates. So for example, 
currently we're contributing about $1.2 million to ongoing street operating costs. If REIT were to decline the 55%, as was the case during uh, the Great Recession, we would we would barely have enough money to sustain those ongoing operations. So by putting a pause on the capital investments, we're protecting the fund balance as a cushion to support those ongoing operating costs, not only this year, but into future years if this revenue source contracts. And if for some reason the revenue picture improves, uh, we can return to the council and recommend that we proceed with um, some of the capital investments that we are uh, deferring or reducing here. So, Tisha, if we can go to the next slide, please. Um, and actually, maybe one last thing before I move on to this slide. So, the REIT fund, um, I think I mentioned, uh, is making transfers to other funds. So, this is another section um, where the budget amendment that will be on uh, discussion to regular business this evening, adjusting those uh, interfund transfers becomes important. Okay, now we can go to the next slide. So uh, the school zone safety fund uh, receives revenue from the uh, uh, speed enforcement camera near Issaquah High School. Um, these cameras are only operational when school is in session. So the closure of the schools uh, since March through, through June is putting a damper on these revenues. Uh, we are anticipating about a $276,000 revenue hit as a result of uh, this closure. Um, this forecast assumes that schools will be back in session uh, in the fall. If that's not the case, then there will be an additional revenue hit here. But the main point with this slide is that this is another fund with a healthy fund balance and um, it can sustain even with this revenue hit and even frankly if there's another revenue hit in uh, the fall could sustain all of the anticipated investments that had been planned in the 2020 adopted budget for this fund. So we are not recommending any major spending changes uh, to this fund at this time. Um, this plan does reflect a modest $24,000 reduction because the uh, firm that manages the cameras for us is not charging us while the schools are not in session. So we are capturing that savings. I also want to point out that uh, in doing this work, um, we have identified that the fine, the penalty charge for people that uh, speed through this zone is uh, below what nearby jurisdictions are charging. So our plan is to return to the council this summer with a plan that would uh, bring that penalty uh, more in line with what our nearby jurisdictions are charging. Um, and I should point out that of the people that um, receive this penalty, 85% live outside of the city of Issaquah. So we will be returning with a plan this summer to increase the penalty um, so that it can be in place when schools open again. This will um, help uh, recover these revenues that had been lost during the shutdown um, and also give us some flexibility to perhaps make additional investments as some of our other revenue sources are contracting. We can move to the next slide, please. So the Municipal Arts Fund uh, derives a majority of its revenues from the admissions tax. An admissions tax is charged on people that attend movie theaters in the city of Issaquah, live theaters. They are all shut down now. This initial forecast assumes a 30% reduction, but certainly depending on the length of the stay-at-home orders, uh, this revenue could uh, contract further. Um, but again, looking at the fund balance on this fund, there is sufficient fund balance to sustain this year's spending um, even if this revenue source contracts. So we are not recommending any underspend plans with uh, the Municipal Arts Fund at this time. Uh, we are and we recognize particularly if the stay-at-home orders um, extend for a longer duration, we will be looking at this fund uh, as part of the 2021 budget process and maybe recommending uh, some changes in uh, to this fund in 2021. Can we move to the next slide, please? 
So uh, the IT fund. Uh, so as I mentioned, I think a little bit earlier, the IT fund is not um, uh, facing revenue challenges per se, but many of the funds that it serves are facing uh, revenue challenges. So we asked the IT team to look at its spending and identify uh, savings mainly to provide relief to the general fund. But uh, some of the, the plans that they identified will also uh, result in savings to some of our other funds. So this slide provides a summary of that savings. Um, and again, all of this is effectuated through a cost allocation plan or interfund transfers. So, um, so that is part of the budget amendment that will be um, before the council uh, for consideration on regular business tonight. And I see there's a question, so I will pause there. Thank you. Council Member Hall. Okay, you have to mute Beth for a second. Thank you. Council thanks. Member Hall has a question on the IT fund. Yeah, thanks, Mayor Pauly. Um, Beth, I just have a quick um, um, question. I'm seeing two numbers associated with IT fund savings to the general fund, uh, and I know you can clear this up for me. So I see this 378,662, $378,662, but then towards the beginning, there was IT savings in round two at $304,000 in 68. So um, I was hoping you can clear up what each of those mean. Yes, so um, on that first slide, the 304,000 uh, is capturing uh, the new savings that we've identified in round two. Uh, you may recall that in round one, we identified a position uh, for layoff that was uh, an IT position. So the savings from that position was captured in round one. Um, uh, this slide here is capturing the full savings, whereas from a general fund balancing perspective, slide, uh, that earlier slide was, was trying to capture what is new, the new delta for tonight. Perfect. Thank you very much. Appreciate that clarification. Uh, I also have a question from Council Member Martz. Hi, Director Goldberg. Um, my question for you is, what does this represent as a total fraction of IT fund? And what are we really talking about when you say underspend? What's the actual meat and potatoes? What, what checks don't get written and cashed uh, to, to realize these savings? Thank you. So um, maybe that's a good opportunity to go to the next slide where um, we've got some additional details on um, what is not going to be done um, through this underspend plan. So I mentioned in response to Council Member Hall's question um, about uh, the, 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 um, the position that w had been slated for layoff. Um, also, um, similar to the other funds that we talked about, we are capturing some savings from furloughs and the elimination of the 457 account. And then there's a series of projects listed on the slide where we're either deferring or reducing um, some of the investments that had been planned uh, for 2020 through the IT fund. And maybe I could pause there and see if uh, Council Member Martz has follow-up questions now that he has seen these details. Just the question about uh, what fraction of the total IT budget this represents. Thank you. So I might have to phone a friend for that one. Um, if Susie's on the line, maybe she, I don't know if she has that at her disposal or she can look it up while I'm finishing the rest of this presentation and we can report that back to you. We have an additional follow-up question from Council President Hunt, and uh, we'll see what we can get from Susie. Council President Hunt. Thank you, Council President Hunt here. I um, 
wonder if, and it it might be um, at a future present, a future meeting that we would get this information. But I wonder if we could get information about the um, implications of the cost reductions um, that were on the previous slide. So especially with um, the REIT slide, there were a number of deferrals and a number of um, a number of uh, reductions. And some of them are specific projects. Some of them, I imagine, are going to be a cost that we'll incur the next year on top of additional costs. And so um, I think for our planning purposes, it would be helpful to understand the implications of all of the costs um, in addition to these ones, which are explained for the IT fund. Yeah, we can uh, report that back to you. Okay. Do you want to continue, Beth? Susie is chasing the numbers. Yes. If you'd like to continue with the presentation, that'd be great. Uh, yes. So if we can move to the next slide, please. So uh, the LTAC fund, the lodging tax fund, uh, similar to municipal arts fund and the school zone safety fund, um, this is a fund that we're anticipating will contract uh, as a result of COVID. Uh, this fund derives its revenues from a surcharge on people staying at local hotels. Uh, so we're assuming a 30% reduction uh, to this revenue source. Again, depending on the length of the stay at home orders, uh, there may be additional reductions that we'll need to recognize here, additional revenue reductions we need to recognize. But like the school zone safety fund and the municipal arts fund, this fund has a healthy fund balance that is enough to sustain the planned spending for uh, the duration of the year. So we are not recommending any underspend for this fund at this time, um, but we are working um, uh, as part of the 2021 budget and we may return later this summer with um, additional plans for this fund. Um, and then just looking at the comments, I um, am seeing Susie has responded. Um, the IT reductions represent about 13.4% of the uh, budget for IT for 2020. So if we can move to the next slide, please. So um, as I mentioned um, uh, at the outset, uh, these underspend plans are within the mayor's authority to, um, to achieve, um, but a number of these um, changes uh, in order to capitalize on the savings in the funds that are actually being constrained, we do need to adjust the interfund transfers. So um, the budget amendment that's on council's agenda later this evening um, includes some items to make those changes to those interfund transfers. So that's one area that will require council action. Um, and then uh, on the consent agenda this evening, there are several uh, changes personnel policies that we will also be seeking uh, council action on. Uh, I see that there may be another question, so I will pause there. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Council President Ray has a question. Hi, this is Chris Ray. Um, Beth, when we talked about the general fund, the administration's position was not to um, draw down on uh, fund balance. And yet, with all of the funds we've talked about today, we're drawing down on fund balance to, you know, maintain spend. Is there, is there a rationale there that um, that you're differentiating between general fund and these other funds? Uh, yeah. So the general fund is supporting um, ongoing services for which the city has an ongoing obligation to continue to provide. So having a fund balance and sustaining a fund balance is important. Um, for example, if the downturn is uh, deeper than we anticipated, or, you know, uh, God forbid there is another, you know, natural disaster that's happening at the same time. There's another, another shock to the budget for which we need to draw revenues on. Uh, things like municipal arts fund, uh, school zone safety fund, uh, and the LTAC fund are uh, very limited in scope. And there aren't necessarily requirements that we continue those functions. So if revenues recover, 
we can continue our, our current spending and, you know, perhaps work to build that fund balance. But if, um, if there's a contraction there, you know, you can have a discussion of you continue the municipal arts function the way it had originally been contemplated or not. We feel like that is um, a better discussion to be having uh, in the context of a formal budget process and that to change course with um, with some of these functions mid-year gets a little bit tricky. So for example, the LTAC fund, um, the city appropriates those dollars, but it's actually the LTAC committee that is setting those spending plans. So in order to change that spending, we'd have to go back to the LTAC committee and ask them to take a vote to change that allocation. So that's kind of the difference between fund balance philosophy on the general fund versus um, versus these other funds. Also, the general fund is the only fund that has a formal fund balance policy at this point um, that we need to honor. And that's, for example, what the bond rating agencies are looking to, that we're maintaining, maintaining those fund balances. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you, Deputy Council President Ray. I am not seeing any additional question and comment. Beth, do you have any additional information to present? Or are we wrapping up? Oops. Actually, Madam Mayor, uh, members of the council, I'm going to take the last few slides uh, to wrap up, if that's all right. Thank you. Uh, Tish, can we have the next slide, please? So next steps, um, as, as we've said at the outset, um, the idea of uh, the first two rounds was to get us to a place that we felt comfortable. Uh, we do not anticipate any other uh, proposals to the city council for any further significant reductions uh, at this point. Uh, as I've been meeting with staff over the last few days, uh, it is the number one question on their mind is, are we done? Uh, and the answer is generally yes, we are done to the best of our understanding. Short of, uh, of other issues or uh, calamities that may fall us, as I think Beth kind of did a good job of, uh, of uh, detailing, uh, we are done. The only exception to that, and I'll, which I'll talk a little bit more in a minute, is our ongoing work regarding the Nisqua Police Department jail. Uh, and if there may be opportunities uh, for closure of the jail prior to the end of the fiscal year, then that would have an, an impact on, on staffing. Uh, but as we look at next steps uh, for the remainder of the year uh, on budget management and planning, we are going to continue to monitor data uh, and pursue additional underspending revenue solutions as they present themselves. I think we've uh, detailed that we have outstanding issues with a number of our bargaining units. Um, so there are some small ways to do that. We certainly are waiting uh, to see if the federal government provides any additional dollars, if there's any additional pass-through from the state of Washington or King County. Uh, our plan on June 9th is to come back to you uh, with an update on the budget schedule because uh, as we uh, end now round two and we look toward the future, uh, the future also includes the preparation of the 2021 budget. Uh, our next major financial update to you, again, uh, pending any other uh, unknown calamities that may occur would be in August, where we would give you a full update, best of our knowledge of where we've ended uh, mid-year, uh, and then our updated financial forecast as we work on the 21 budget, and then in September uh, begin the uh, 2021 proposed budget process. Next slide. Uh, two other pieces uh, that we have been working on, which I'd like to give you a brief update on, are the reorganizations of two departments. As the council is aware, we started work on these reorganizations earlier this year. Um, we have been working with the staff of Public Works Operations, Public Works Engineering on models for combining the departments. Uh, that work continues. Uh, now that we will have interim directors of both departments, uh, we can move to the next phase of that, which will be to advertise for and recruit a new Public Works Director for a single Public Works Department. Uh, given uh, the challenges that uh, we are facing, uh, the issue of hiring staff uh, at this executive level, I think is a question, uh, and I want to take an opportunity to reach out to the uh, community of recruiters that work to hire uh, these types of positions to get a sense of what the marketplace is like 
Uh, certainly, all good public works directors are busy serving their communities uh, through this crisis, and I think we're going to have to uh, pay close attention to the marketplace to see when an appropriate time would be to begin a full recruitment, uh, and we'll keep the council apprised of that. Uh, the other department reorganization that we've been looking at is our development services department. Uh, those discussions also began before the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, we are uh, resuming those discussions. Uh, there have been some impacts with uh, position reductions uh, through round one that have had an impact on the department. And uh, Deputy City Administrator Schneider and I will be meeting with the uh, staff of uh, DSD over the next uh, few weeks uh, to begin uh, uh, re-begin those reorganization projects, projects in development services. Next slide. Um, with this uh, presentation this evening, uh, we really see ourselves uh, turning yet uh, another corner as part of our new normal, um, and we believe it is appropriate to uh, begin re re resuming more of our uh, regular projects and initiatives. Uh, as we've indicated a few times this evening, our intention is to resume the study session schedule with the City Council starting on June 9th, uh, having uh, two study sessions in June, two in July, uh, one in August, um, which we'll cover a whole variety of, of different issues. I've listed some of them here on this slide. Uh, the issue of recovery and reopening, uh, lots of issues, uh, economic development, uh, the logistics of reopening our own city facilities, all of that needs careful attention, and so we will continue to focus on that. Uh, next is the MUNIS re-implementation. Again, much has been discussed by the Council. Uh, the Council approved a, a, a contract to do this, so this will be a prime focus of ours uh, through the summer months into the fall uh, as we shoot uh, to uh, relaunch our, our general ledger, general financial operations systems uh, beginning January 1, 2021. Also, as I mentioned this evening, jail operations. As we've looked at the city uh, assessment of program and looking at the initiatives that we can pursue, uh, there's been interest on the council and interest among senior staff to continue to look at jail operations. There are a number of issues associated with that, uh, but we feel uh, that the opportunities for the city are significant enough uh, that we need to continue to focus on exploring that, and we will keep the council apprised uh, of, of our work. If we are able uh, to uh, make a recommendation to the council that this would occur prior to the end of the fiscal year, uh, then that is something that we would look at and look at the, the impacts that would have on staffing for the current fiscal year. Water operations and fees, another issue uh, that has been uh, on the back burner since the beginning of the year, we need to bring back forward to you, and we plan during a study session uh, in June or July uh, to come and resume that discussion regarding water operations and fees. Uh, issues regarding community engagement, as we've talked previously on June 1st, uh, we'll begin um, community engagement uh, initiatives remotely. Um, three specific items. One is a broader look at how we engage our neighborhoods, and we currently plan to come to the study session on June 9th with an update on that initiative. Uh, you've heard from a public speaker this evening about the work we're doing with sustainability, uh, not only having a community convening on sustainability issues later this summer, but also the work regarding the Rivers and Streams uh, Board and uh, the reconstitution of that. And then finally, uh, another initiative that will start up again in the month of June is issues regarding the Mobility Master Plan. Next slide. So, Madam Mayor, members of the Council, uh, that concludes our, our presentation this evening, I will, on behalf of uh, your excellent finance team and all of the department directors uh, that have worked so diligently over the last eight weeks, it's been a very, very difficult process uh, to assess where we were because of the COVID-19 crisis, to take decisive action, uh, to uh, make adjustments to the budget that we think are appropriate as we move forward as a city, but also being prudent uh, to keep reserves in place so that if there is a second wave of the coronavirus, if there's anything else that would uh, bring, uh, would come to the city where we would need resources, that those resources are still available to us. Again, Madam Mayor, members of the Council, uh, uh, Ms. Goldberg, myself, others are available to answer any questions. Thank you for that, City Administrator. Um, I do want to go back to Council President Hunt to see if there were any email comments to the City Council that she would like to summarize on this item. 
Thank you. This is Council President Hunt. We did receive an email um, with comments on this informational item from Steve Pereira. He um, <coughs> commented that he is looking to the Issaquah City Council to be active members in this budget and prioritization process. Um, regarding the school safety fund, he was okay with the increase in the fine structure. And lastly, regarding the um, administration's plan to rely on fund balance to sustain the 2020 budgeted expenditures um, and then evaluate as part of the 2021 budget process, he asked some clarifying questions about what else we will be able to do to close the projected revenue gap. That concludes the correspondence. Thank you very much, Council President Hunt. Uh, Deputy Council President Ray, do you have a question or a comment? It's more of a cl uh, clarification, and I, I apologize if I, I missed this, but on page five of the presentation, there was a general fund summary that showed the initial pre forecasted deficit at $10 million, and then round one spend at 4.8, uh, remaining shortfall of 5.2, and then we just covered the, the round two underspend plan of one point six that still left us two point or three point six million dollars of shortfall. And I thought I heard um Administrator Balkwood say that we were done with um additional cuts and I, I did how do we fill that three point six or did I miss something? Administrator Bobquitz Well, at this time, uh, Council President Ray, members of the council, I think there's a there's a number of outstanding issues that uh, may very well uh help us with that. One is the uh, CARES grant money that the state of Washington is passing through. That's about $1.1 million. Uh, there will be money uh, from the federal government, I'm confident, to help cities uh, and states. Uh, it will not be at the level that the uh, HEROES Act that was passed by the U.S. House of Representatives uh, had the amount of money that would have been included for Issaquah, and that was $12 million. Um, and so we don't suspect to see that. I think, though, that it is safe to say uh, that there will be a small, a smaller amount of money um, that will come. It's unclear as to when that will happen. It's unclear to how much that will be. Um, so I think there's that. And then I think uh, anything else, uh, we can hope that our projections perhaps were, uh, were, were, were more dire than the reality is. And I think that at that point, if you take the CARES Act money, what we get from the federal government, uh, we're probably under a million dollars uh, to reach that 10 million. And I think as we stand here this early still in the year, uh, I am comfortable in discussions with the mayor, she's comfortable um, that if we would have to rely then on fund balance for the remainder, that's a relatively small amount uh, given the scope of what we've accomplished. Great, thank you. Um, so just to kind of paraphrase, we're, we're doing a little bit of risk management here, and we, we know we've got a certain amount of this gap that, that we don't have a plan to fill, but we believe that it's reasonable to think that we we are going to be able to fill it um, through external funding, um, un, unseen additional um, expense reductions, um, or if uh, as a fallback uh, fund balance. Fair assessment. Yeah. That, that's, that's what I think I heard you say. Great. Thank you, Wally. Appreciate it. And, and, and if I may, Deputy Council President, uh, uh, Finance Director Goldberg has a news comment as well. Yeah, thank you, uh, City Administrator Bob Quitz. Just wanted to add, um, did a little bit of an analysis of um, that three mil, that $3.6 million uh, that remains. If we get the CARES Act funding, um, and we apply it plus some of these additional uh, things that uh, we've talked about through the evening. Um, while we might have to draw on fund balance, fund balance as a percent of expenditures, which is what the policy is set on, um, would actually remain fairly constant to where we were at the start of the year because we have mm -hmm. been reducing expenditures. So we started the year with uh, fund balance equaling roughly 30% of expenditures when you take into account all the underspend plans plus um, the infusion potentially of the CARES Act funding uh, and you do the calculation on that, we would remain at about 30%. Um, Deputy Council President Ray, this is the Mayor. I'm just gonna add a couple of, of thoughts here. Um, most of the funding sources that we're talking about for COVID um, can go only for COVID-related expenses um, 
for the city or if the city chooses to do for businesses, et cetera. The money that um, the um, federal uh, or that the health was actually be able to be used as far as we know for uh, revenue replacement. So that's the first funding source that could actually do some revenue replacement. But just to get you all thinking about August, I'll remind you that if we get it this year, we do not have it likely. They're, I think they broke it into two buckets, a significant bucket in 2020 and a lesser amount in 2021. Uh, but it's not a solution because it's just it's just a little bit of help in, in 20 and 21. So just something to think about as we come into budget in the fall. I am not seeing that there are any additional questions, but I will wait a few seconds to see. Actually, I think I did have a, yes, sorry, Council Member Hunt has a, uh, sorry, Council Member Hall has a question. Thank you, Mayor Polly. Uh, this is Zach Hall. I just wanted to ask a real quick um, clarifying question of Director Goldberg of what you just said, because uh, I thought it was um, probably the most important line that I've heard all evening. So um, you said using fund balance, you know, as a percentage of expenditures, even if we were using fund balance, it would still remain similar to the beginning of the year because of the reductions that we've been making in, in current expenditures throughout the year. Is that correct? Uh, that's correct. So the fund balance policy um, is set at ex uh, fund balance as a percentage of expenditures. So as we're, as we're lowering the expenditures, the um, amount of fund balance that is required by policy or to maintain current levels actually decreases. So um, the combination of expenditures going down and then if we have to take the modest draws on fund balance, um, the math of that would be such that we would be at about 30% um, at the end of all of this. Council Member Hall? That was excellent, thank you. Great, not seeing any other uh, questions or comments from Council. I will move to the next item on the agenda this evening. Thank you, Director Goldberg. Thank you, City Administrator Bob Quitz. Next item is the consent calendar and it was distributed to council in advance. And if it's authorized, the items on the consent calendar will be considered together and approved by one motion. Um, the clerk's office has circulated and posted a revised copy of the May 4th regular council meeting minutes, agenda item C to correct the call to order time. This is the version that will be adopted upon approval of the consent calendar. Have the payables and payroll been reviewed? They have. This is Zach Hall, they have. Thank you. And Council Member Goodman's voice, I believe. Does any Council Member desire sorry, to that was Sorry, that's Council President Hunt. Uh, ah, they have been approved. Thank you very much. Does any Council Member desire to remove any items or items from the consent calendar and considered under regular business? Before we move to the motion, Council President Hunt, do you have any email comments to share on the consent calendar items? Thank you. Um, yes, this is Council President Hunt. We do have uh, one email with specific references to consent calendar items. Um, we received an email from Steve Pereira, so I will do my best to summarize um, per item. On AB 7809, which is King County Flood District, Flood Control District grant, he recommended approval. On um, AB 7963, Federal Community Development Block Grant, asked um, clarifying questions regarding reasons for having not submitted a grant application previously. Holiday Inn um, lift station change order, uh, AB 7965, asked clarifying questions. AB 7971, um, amendment to personnel policies, um, commented on the part of that AB that refers to the senior leadership team being eligible for an annual bank of 80 hours and managers being eligible for an annual bank of 60 hours um, and wanted to see the bank potential extended beyond managers and the senior leadership team. And that concludes the um, items that had comments. Thank you, Council President Hunt. Is there a motion? 
This is Council I'll President Hunt. I move to approve the consent calendar um, as as presented in this evening's agenda. Hi, this is Chris Ray. I will second the motion. It's been moved and seconded, so we'll have the clerk proceed with the roll call vote. Council Member D. Michelle. Aye. Council Member Goodman. Aye. Council Member Hall. Aye. Council President Hunt. Aye. Council Member Martz. Aye. Deputy Council President Ray. Aye. Council Member Walsh. Aye. That's seven ayes, zero nays. Thank you very much. That passes unanimously. Next item we'll be moving to is regular business. And before we begin, I'd like to clarify that there are two agenda bills under the regular business tonight, but only one proposed action, adoption of an ordinance that encompasses both items. Staff will begin by presenting the budget amendment, AB 7926, followed by council questions. Staff will then present the budget reauthorizations, AB 7930, followed by council questions. Then council may choose to make a motion to adopt the ordinance and debate both items. AB 7926, the first 2020 budget amendment, and I'd like to ask Senior Budget Analyst Susie Monsell to make a presentation. Susie. Thank you, Mayor. Um, can everybody hear me? Yes, we can. Excellent. Um, thank you. Uh, I will give Tisha a moment to pull up the presentation. Um, the first presentation that I'll be giving tonight, both uh, should be pretty brief. Um, the first one um, is this first 2020 budget amendment. Um, so I think you can go to the next slide. Great, thank you. Um, so the purpose of this proposed amendment uh, is primarily to implement the changes to interfund transfers uh, that Director Goldberg uh, discussed earlier this evening, as well as those discussed in round one um, that require uh, an adjustment to those inner fund transfers in order to recognize the savings in the fund where uh, those savings are needed. Um, but it also implements um, a couple of budget changes associated with earlier council action, and I'll get into those uh, in a moment as well. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so. There are three types of items included tonight. Um, the first is uh, the previously approved request. So these are items that went through by agenda bill um, through the council um, that just needed formal action through a budget amendment to actually be included in uh, the amended 2020 budget. There are two of those items uh, this evening. There is also one um, that has come before the council before but not necessarily um, in a formal addition of funds to the budget. Um, we consider this a budget correction. It doesn't really reflect a change in policy. Uh, it just corrects a uh, prior error to the um, to, uh, expenditures in the budget. Um, the bulk of the amendments that we'll be seeing tonight, um, seven of which um, are these interfund transfer adjustments um, that uh, Director Goldberg mentioned. Uh, next slide, please. So the previously approved request, uh, the first uh, came in AB 7948, which was the Renters Assistance Program. It added um, $100,000 of general fund or um, allocated $100,000 of general fund dollars for that Renters Assistance Program. Uh, the second item was accepting a 2020 census outreach um, funding for that out census outreach uh, in AB 7929. Uh, as well as the corresponding uh, expenditures uh, in use of those funds. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, the one budget correction uh, included tonight is filling an under budget in uh, a 2019 street capital project, which was the Gilman Boulevard and Three Trails Crossing. Uh, this was presented, um, I believe, in late March or early April um, by the Public Works Operations Department. It was uh, accepting a contract for this work. Um, and uh, in further evaluation of this project, it had been determined that 300000 of the $375,000 um, of project costs hadn't had an identified revenue source when it had originally been um, added to the budget a few years ago. Um, so this corrects that error um, by allocating uh, 
$300,000 out of street capital fund balance, um, which would ultimately be utilizing um, an underspend on another capital project that wasn't using those dollars. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So, um, as I said, the bulk of the items tonight are the changes to the interfund transfers. Um, I can uh, talk about these in broad, quick strokes, um, as Director Goldberg already provided um, significant detail. Um, but these first four were from round one, which was presented about a month ago. Um, the first was uh, adjusting the transfer between the general fund and the cable TV fund. The second, uh, between the general fund and the sustainability fund. The third, between the general fund and the debt service non-voted fund. And the fourth, um, in regards to the cost allocation, the new cost allocation policy um, for city facility uh, costs, which primarily uh, affects the general fund as well as uh, street operating and the utilities. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So the last three um, items of the 10 uh, amendments tonight um, were presented earlier this evening in round two, uh, the adjustment um, of the IT fund and the eight funds that it ultimately, that ultimately feed into the IT fund, um, the general fund and the street operating fund, and finally between the REIT and the five funds um, that uh, were benefiting from projects um, that are now um, being reduced in scope. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so ultimately the slide reflects um, all of the revenue and expenditure impacts across all of the funds um, affected by tonight's um, amendment. The net impact across all the funds is a negative $400,000 excuse me, which is primarily just the renter's assistance program and the uh, street capital uh, project correction. Um, all of the inner fund transfers uh, are balanced in that one fund goes up, one fund goes down. Um, so those uh, have a net across all funds of uh, zero. Uh, next slide, please, which I believe is just questions. Great, okay, um, so that is uh, the budget amendment presentation. Um, there is a budget reauthorization presentation that follows this, but um, I wanted to certainly give the opportunity for any questions on the amendments. Thank you, Susie. That is great. I am not seeing any questions or comments right now on AB 7926. So feel free to move on to AB 7930, 2020 budget reauthorization. Thank you, um, and I'll give Tisha uh, a moment to pull that one up. Uh, let me take a step back here. Councilmember Hunt, did you have anything you wanted to add uh, to summarize public comments that might have been emailed on AB 7926, or did I ask you that already? Um, this is Council President Hunt. I do, but um, I will save that for the second okay. presentation because it's tied together. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Great. Uh, so budget reauthorizations. Um, uh, I think we can go to the first slide. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the purpose of this presentation um, is requesting uh, Council approval to reauthorize certain funds which uh, were previously budgeted in 2019 uh, for expenditure in 2020. Uh, next slide, please. So the background on budget reauthorizations in general, um, typically this is an annual housekeeping matter um, that is done at the beginning of every year um, once you uh, close out the previous year. Um, and a budget reauthorization uh, typically just reallocates unspent funding authority for an unfinished project from the prior fiscal year, in this case, 2019, into the next fiscal year uh, to allow the, for the completion of the project. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So uh, 2020, uh, we'll be doing a little bit different of an approach from prior years, um, primarily because in prior years, the city wasn't really following best practice when it comes to reauthorization. 
uh, in prior years, reauthorizations were included in the annual budget. Um, and since the annual budget uh, is, uh, that process begins usually June or July um, of, the, um, of the prior year for which you are budgeting, uh, obviously that year isn't finished yet, so you don't necessarily have a clear picture of how much you're going to be spending on each project. So in prior years, the year-end project spend, so the spend on each project, was anticipated based on actuals only through mid-2019, uh, or excuse me, in for the, in the prior year, let's put it that way. Um, and what this leads to is a lack of transparency over new budget authority versus reauthorization um, for each project. So it wasn't always clear um, in, for a given project how much of that funding was new to that budget year and how much had been reauthorized from prior years. Uh, but for 2020, uh, we, are, we, could, we separated it from the annual budget process. Um, so our year-end project spend was confirmed based on year-end actuals. When we closed the 2019 um, financials, we were able to calculate how much was spent on each project that was being considered for reauthorization so that we made sure we weren't exceeding um, the prior year uh, authority for that project. Um, and what this ultimately gives us is clarity uh, over what is new 2020 project cost and what is carried forward. And it gives us um, some uh, better authenticity in the numbers that we're providing. And the end result of this is that the 2020 process better aligns with best practice um, and what we're seeing from uh, many of our neighboring jurisdictions. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so the items that can be considered for reauthorization. Um, so unspent funds for routine expenses. So things like office supplies um, or, uh, you know, things like travel and training or things like that um, are not eligible for reauthorization. Um, to be eligible for reauthorization, it must be uh, a discrete project um, that had originally be intended to be completed in 2019, but was not finished um, for various reasons and uh, must be continued into 2020 to be completed. Um, it is also required that funds originally appropriated in 2019 remain to support the continuation of that project in 2020. Um, so what this means is that the, uh, if funds were transferred for, uh, to support that project, that those funds were transferred and they are still available in fund balance to use for this project. Um, next slide, please. Um, so what made this year also a little uh, unique uh, as it made many other things unique um, is in response to the COVID-19 budget reductions, we did a full re-examination of what we had intended to propose for reauthorization. Um, originally, we had intended to present these reauthorization proposals to the council um, in late March, um, but, you know, due to many other things getting pushed down the calendar, um, this did as well, but that allowed us the opportunity to re-examine um, these items before we brought them to the council. Um, and from this re-examination, what resulted was uh, a nearly uh, $1.9 million less than originally considered across all funds and all projects, and the elimination of 11 projects from the original list. Um, and uh, what remains then are primarily projects where the funds have already been spent in the first half of 2020, um, or are longer term capital projects with a dedicated revenue source. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so this summarizes uh, all of the items for consideration and the detail of those items um, were uh, included in the packet this evening. Um, so the list of specific projects and the specific amount for each project. Um, this just summarizes the number of projects by fund and the total expenditures by fund. Um, but I also wanted to flag here that several projects um, have an accompanying, accompanying revenue reauthorization as well. Um, which is primarily, uh, or it's, it's grants, um, ex pretty exclusively. Um, so when a reauthorized project is reliant on a revenue source that is sitting in fund balance, or that has already been uh, included in its fund balance, um, if it's a grant, for example, that's a, uh, typically a, re or a um, reimbursement grant, 
um, we won't bill for that grant until the project um, expenditures have occurred, uh, which means that those grant revenues aren't available in fund balance yet. So we need to make sure that we carry forward those revenues along with those expenditures um, to make sure that we understand that those revenues are still coming um, and uh, so that it wouldn't create a false um, negative fund balance. Uh, next slide, please. All right, just questions. Um, I'm happy to, uh, of course, answer any questions um, from this presentation or if there are any uh, that linger from the prior presentation. Susie, thank you. I'm going to go back to Council President Hunt first. There were some public comments received on this and the prior agenda bill. Council President Hunt. Thank you. We received a email from um, Steve Pereira on this item on AB um, 7930, the budget reauthorization. And he um, asked what actions, if any, are our forecast that previously approved grants may not be fully funded and the corresponding impact to the budget of not receiving such funds. Um, and wondered because budget constraints by original grants or may result in delay or canceling of such funding. That concludes the um, email comments on this item. Thank you, Council President Hunt. I see Council Member Walsh has a question. Got to get to the microphone and unmute myself. Okay, I have I have a few questions. So first of all, I wanted to say I very much appreciate bringing up this reauthorization idea um, and the transparency it provides. Um, in the past, it's always been a little bit murky what was spent out of a previous budget year, what was continuing on, what was a new authorization of funds. So I, I really appreciate this concept here. Um, what I'm trying to get a sense of, because this is packaged in a general idea about our financial situation, um, we're looking at this on a numbers basis, but I think it's really important for us to think about this on the project impact side. And so when, when we look at many of these projects um, that we're talking about lower authorizations for, I really need to get a sense of what the impact is on the project. Is that a, you know, less is being done on the project, uh, use the dog park for an example um, that has less money that's being reauthorized for that. Does that mean less is being done for that? Does it mean that, hey, construction was delayed and so we're expecting a continued sense of cost in 2021? Um, it, is there cost savings that was discovered in the first portion of um, doing the work in 2019? I think that's the level of visibility that I think I need to see to understand this. Thank you, Council Member Walsh. Um, is this City Administrator Bob Kowitz or Finance Director Goldberg on the project? Uh, Madam Mayor, members of the Council, uh, I think it's uh, a question uh, for, I'm sorry, I'm getting text messages, hold on. Um, I, I think each each project has its own story. Um, I understand from the Deputy City Administrator that Susie's not uh, prepared to speak individually to these. Uh, we can put the slides back up and I can do my best. I think, Madam Mayor, I think it might be a good idea, a better sense of the Council. Um, of where folks stand and how much time you'd like to spend on this this evening uh, versus uh, putting this to another meeting. Um, not sure where everybody stands on that right now, but I know Council President Hunt has a question and a comment, so let's start there. This is Council President Hunt. I, um, I had a very similar questions, concerns to Council Member Walsh. I feel that, um, as, and as I asked earlier, there are projects here where we are deferring costs into next year, but there are also, I think, a lot of, um, a lot of projects that will have 
implications in terms of the services that will be provided, and those are not explained here. Um, so for me, uh, there's a big piece missing as far as what the actual implications are and um, what the timelines are for the project's implications of these changes. Thank you. And I see Deputy Council President Ray has a comment. I'm working on the mute. Uh, hi, this is <laughs> this is. Uh, I got the uh, mayor's problem. This is uh, <laughs> this is Chris Chris Ray. Uh, you know, you know. I think that there's enough question about what the budget or the output impact of the reauthorizations is going to be, particularly with the projects that have been uh, reduced in scope. And we have deferred this until this date anyway. I think this is something where we could easily push this off and get a little more information so the council would be more comfortable in making a decision with the reauthorizations with a better understanding of what the service delivery impact would be associated with them. Thank you. I have a question for the city administrator, and that is, what other additional information would you like from the council members to understand their need? Uh, do you have any questions for them about additional information? Oh, I'm on. I'm on. All right. You're Sorry. on. <laughs> You're on. I just want to make sure before we close this out that um, the administration is clear in what additional explanation uh, needs to be provided in order for the council members to feel like they are ready to move forward with this. Uh, Madam Mayor, members of the council, um, I'm looking – uh, at some information we provided to the council earlier today. Uh, it's a relatively small number of projects. Um, I think that we, sh we can be able uh, to come back. Some of them, I, I, I think we can provide a, a, a narrative uh, in a staff report and then briefly walk through it at the council meeting. I, I think we know what we, we need to do. Okay, a second question. Since the council is going to move towards um, just one motion, does this impact the nature of the motion for tonight or both these items coming back? Um, Madam Mayor, members of the council, I don't know a reason why we couldn't hold both items at this point. Um, I think the, uh, the other budget transfers were just uh, good timing housekeeping for us, and I think if, uh, your, your agenda for June 1 is already uh, pretty light at this point, so we can come back on June 1 uh, with this information, and I think if action's taken, I don't think that will have any material impact on our operations. Thank you. So do we need a motion to continue this to the June 1st meeting? And I'd ask the, the city clerk for guidance on an appropriate motion. Uh, this is uh, Tisha. Typically, the council has made a motion to postpone an item that they had planned to take action on at a given meeting. Um, I don't believe that's a requirement as there's no motion pending currently. Mm. So um, I think we've uh, received direction from them if there's a desire to formalize that through a formal motion to postpone these agenda bills, someone could proceed to do that and take a formal vote. Oh, I think it, um, hmm, that's a great question. We've only heard from uh, to council members, um, if I don't see anybody else wishing to comment on this, I will assume that direction as provided is good enough and we do not need to have a motion. Um, council member Hall, you have a question. Thanks, Mayor Polly. Uh, this is Zach Hall. I just had a quick follow-up question to what um, City Administrator Balkowitz was saying. Um, I'm always concerned how much we ask of you all and your staff, and so um, it seemed to me what I heard from you was that it seems doable that you could come back to council with uh, to have a discussion about this. I just wanted to confirm that and also what the scope of the work would be. Would it be breaking out each of these funds and saying these are all the projects that are being affected, or is it just um, projects that are being affected um, to a certain extent, what, what's your vision in terms of uh, what can be done? Yeah, go ahead. I, 
I think our understanding of the question is that on um, the reauthorizations, it's funding for particular projects. Right. And so um, if I'm understanding correctly, the council members would like to understand what does that mean to that specific project? So it's not so much of the funding source as it is, is this a smaller project? Is this delayed? Is this canceled? So getting just a better understanding of the impacts to each individual project. City Administrator Bob Quitz, is that your understanding? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Council uh, Member Hall, does that answer your question? Mm, yeah, I guess so. Um, I had mentioned the funds really because that's kind of how it was structured and presented to us mm -hmm. like this. So I was envisioning a project list within each fund um, that would, but it sounds like I'm. Sounds like council is talking about something else. So I'm maybe I'm maybe it needs to be repeated again. I'm not following. Okay, let me get um, Director Goldberg to add something in as well, and then we'll go to a comment from Council Member Walsh. So um, I guess I'm a, a little confused too and would like some clarification. So uh, the reauthorizations are not, for the most part, impacted by the round two plan. Um, so those a few of those were reduced because of COVID, but it's basically carrying forward work. So I'm hearing there being a request for an explanation of projects that are being reduced, but very few of that is in the reauthorization. Most of that is in um, the budget amendment uh, related to the interfund transfers. We did provide lists of most of those projects in the presentation of what would be deferred and what would be reduced. Um, perhaps there is an, uh, uh, a desire for more specifics, but I wanna be clear um, what we're providing that for. Is it for both the reauthorization, which has less to do with the reductions, or is it the budget amendment and the transfers that are impacted by the round uh, two reduction? So if I can get some clarification on that, that will help guide our work over the next couple of weeks. Sure, I'll head back to Council Member Walsh. Great. So um, the reason that this came up for me was um, looking in our packet, let me get back to it. Page 234 of our packet has um, Exhibit A, which shows the full project list. And then we've had a few different emails going around, one with a PDF, one with an Excel um, document. And the Excel document that really shows the difference between the previously proposed reauthorization amount and the updated, it, I'm seeing over a dozen projects, it looks like, where the project just doesn't have a new reauthorization amount, which to me means it was canceled or delayed. I don't know what that means for that project. And so I'm trying to understand on the sign code update, for example, why um, the previous authorization was 57,000 and the new reauthorization is only 11,000. You know, are we not spending the 46,000? Is that going to be spent later? So I'm trying to understand this on a project by project basis, not really on the fund basis, but what this is an impact for our community. Thank you, Councilmember Walsh. I think that was my understanding and city administrators as well as the status of the project based on on the table that you're looking at. I just want to check in and see if there are any other council members that have a question or a comment on this. And if not, uh, we'll take the direction provided, which is to bring back that project list on June 1st with some additional explanations. Okay, uh, City Administrator Bob Quitz, did you want to add anything? Or are we good to go? We're good to go. Thank you. So thank you for that. The next item on the agenda this evening is good of the order. And do any council members have something for good of the order? I believe council member Martz suggested that he had something. There you go. Council member Martz. Thank you, Madam Mayor. So I wanted to discuss a resolution passed by the Sound Cities Association. Um, and let me just, well, I should say, uh, yeah. 
Uh, it says, whereas the Sound Cities Association has declared a commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion as an organizational priority, whereas since the outbreak of COVID-19, immigrant and refugee community leaders and civil rights organizations have reported a regional and national increase in bias, harassment, and hate crimes, particularly against Asian American and Pacific Islander, Black and African American, Hispanic and Latino, and other marginalized communities, whereas misinformation about coronavirus propagates fear that hurts people and impairs the ability of our first responders and other city services to provide necessary response to COVID-19. And whereas each of us can and should promote inclusiveness, celebrate diversity, support all fellow community members, prevent the spread of misinformation, and reject hate and bias in all forms. Whereas the Sound Cities Association and its member cities reject racially based bias, harassment, and hate crimes due to COVID-19 will not tolerate discrimination of any kind and denounces all COVID-19 related misnaming, blaming and harassment based on race, ethnicity, place of origin, physical ability, socioeconomic status, uh, gender identity, sexual orientation, age or religion, and whereas we ask community members who observe or, or are experiencing incidents of discrimination, harassment or hate crimes to report the incident uh, to call 911 in emergency circumstances or to contact the Washington State Human Rights Commission, and it has a number, or the King County Office of Civil Rights with a number. Now, therefore, we, the Sound Cities Association, do hereby proclaim our commitment to an inclusive community that rejects stigma and bias related to COVID-19, and we urge all our members and residents of our member cities to treat each other with respect and work together to overcome all expressions of hate and bigotry. So. Uh, in addition to Sound Cities Association, the cities of Redmond, Brenton, Burien, and SeaTac, as well as the Port of Seattle, have also issued similar proclamations having to do specifically with COVID-19 and uh, targeted communities. So my question for my fellow council members is whether we want to consider joining uh, FCA and uh, the cities that I've mentioned already. I, um, in addition, I perhaps mentioned Bellevue uh, has also passed a, a similar proclamation. Um, so whether we want to consider at a future meeting uh, some similar proclamation um, and the urgency that surrounds the response to COVID-19. Thank you. I am looking in the comment box to see who would like to speak to this. I have a question for um, Council Member Mark. Did, was it the board of SCA that approved it, or did this happen at a PIC meeting? Uh, it was the PIC unanimously recommending that the board adopt the policy, I believe, okay. is technically how it went. Okay. Thank you. We have comments from Councilmember D. Michelle, followed by Councilmember Hunt. Oh, I'm sorry. Before before we move on, I'm sure. sorry. I, I said unanimously. It was not unanimous. We had several cities that um, abstained from voting, but it was uh, greater than 85% of the members okay. present. Okay, Thanks. great. Uh, Council Member D. Michelle, followed by Council President Hunt. Uh, thank you, Mayor Polly. I uh, would also be very interested in seeing uh, a, uh, a proclamation similar to this, uh, you know, uh, edited to reflect uh, Issaquah's uh, interest in it. Uh, and I would like to, I would very much like to uh, work on that and have that come before us uh, perhaps next uh, next month. Uh, so I support um, having this on the agenda in a future meeting. Thank you. Uh, Council President Hunt followed by Council Member Goodman. Thank you. This is Council President Hunt. I, I too, am interested in um, this uh, similar proclamation to the one um, from SCA on this topic and wanted to um, add that we, we have received some um, concern about this and questions from the community about what we are doing to um, to be an inclusive community and to um, prevent any sort of bias. And um, I think that it is appropriate at, at this time. So I, I do support it. And I also would ask that during that um, conversation, we have information presented about what we are doing in terms of our messaging um, and, and other actions 
to um, counteract bias so that we can have a conversation about actions that accompanies this um, resolution. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Goodman, followed by Deputy Council President Ray. Uh, thank you, Council Member Goodman here. Um, we have had two or three proclamations in the last, oh, I want to say 15 years. I can't remember. We went through this history a couple of years ago or a year and a half ago. Um, and so uh, while I support the, um, the message and the words, um, I am concerned that we, um, we actually do things that make a difference and we actually have actions rather than just piling on words. Um, and so I, I think I would be, would be interested in knowing how this would be any different from what we've done in the past. Um, and because I'm not hearing how it would be any different, we did have a presentation last year about um, what, um, what a difference it made in our proclamations and I frankly can't recall at this point um, because it was a while ago. But, um, but that's my concern is that we do things that make a difference, not just um, do things that feel good at the time. So I'm, it's not that I'm not interested. I just uh, want to make sure that we do things that make a difference because this, these kinds of things are significant and um, I, I, let me back that up. I want to make sure that what we do for the concerns that are significant are actually actions that um, that are significant in response and not just words. Thanks. Thank you. Deputy Council President Ray. Thank you, Mayor Polly. This is Chris Ray. Um, I'm a little bit. Um, aligned with Councilmember Goodman. I think this is something that we've talked about a lot, and I think it's something that this body is completely on board with, which is inclusion, anti-hate, anti-bias, um, and making that resolution. So as, as we move forward with this, and if we're going to tag it to COVID-19, I'd like to know what specifically um, is different about COVID-19 than um, our more global proclamation that says we, we don't support it, we don't condone it, we actively try and crush it wherever we find it. So um, so as we move forward, I just want to be, and if we're going to tag it with COVID-19, I just wanted to speak specifically to what we could do um, in this theater or in this, uh, this situation. But I, I, I completely reaffirm our commitment to, to the values that the proclamation talks about. Thank you for bringing it forward, Council Member Martz. Thank you, Deputy Council President Ray. A comment from Council President Hunt, followed by Council Member DeMichelle. Thank you, this is Council President Hunt. Um, I, I agree as well about the need for um, action to back up um, any sort of proclamation that we do so that we are, um, so that we're taking meaningful um, actions with what we're working on. And so that's that's one of the reasons why um, in my comments I was suggesting we discuss what actions we are taking we are taking. And I know from talking with Autumn, our communications and um, communications department director, that we are um, in our communications and in our messaging taking specific steps regarding um, uh, anti-bias in our messaging and so I think we we have actions to back this up and we should um, discuss those and discuss what else we can do so I would I would um, be supportive of this kind of proclamation especially if we can pair it with the discussion about what actions we can take thanks thank you uh, council member de Michelle thank you mayor Polly um, I, uh, I take to heart the comments about uh, making a difference and making sure that we're not just putting out empty words. Uh, I agree with that. Um, however, I, I want to remind everybody of the power of the bully puppet. And uh, we, um, as a council, making a statement like this, that is very meaningful to the communities that are directly impacted uh, by discrimination and marginalization. 
And just to give you one example, a number of years ago, the City Council honored uh, Passage Point uh, for its diversity efforts. Um, and I can tell you, uh, visiting Passage Point shortly after that occurred, uh, that those people were thrilled and uh, felt so recognized and so acknowledged uh, by that gesture on behalf of the council and, and the mayor at the time. And so uh, if we think that words don't matter or that that's not important to uh, marginalized communities, uh, I, I really think that we're wrong. I think it's really important um, and it really is meaningful to them. Um, and just to, uh, just in response to uh, Councilmember Ray's comments about how is this different, um, I think there's been well documented that uh, in this particular case, um, in many, many people in the Chinese community and then of course the greater Asian community have been targeted unfortunately, um, uh, uh, unfortunately because of some of the things that appear in the media and so forth. And so there is a particular reason why there's an urgency around this uh, to really point out again that uh, we, we do not tolerate those kinds of actions uh, in our community. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member D. Michelle. I'm not seeing any other council members wishing to comment at this time. I'd like to ask City Administrator Bobkowitz if the request is clear and uh, possible to add for the June 1st agenda as being suggested. Uh, Madam Mayor, members of the council, uh, certainly transmitting a uh, resolution is certainly something we can do. I think the challenge is the compilation of work uh, that we have been doing. Quite honestly, um, a lot of the resources that we've devoted to this have been limited uh, through changes with the COVID-19. Uh, if, if, if you just would like to hear what we've been doing with messaging, we can do that. Uh, if you're looking for a broader uh, analysis or scope of things, I think we would need until June 15th. Sorry, I had to unmute myself. Not seeing any other comments of council members wishing to comment at this time, but I do know that council member Hall also had something he wanted to bring for good of the order. Council member Hall. Thank you, Mayor Polly. Uh, this is Zach Hall. Um, I just wanted to quickly say, um, some of you on council and the community may know that um, but a year ago today, I lost a friend of mine to suicide and uh, spent most of the weekend and today reflecting and remembering him. Um, and really, I just wanted to take this opportunity now as a council member to remind everyone to please take good care of yourself and your friends and your family during this challenging time. Um, and just to remember that, you know, no matter what you may think or hear or how helpless or alone you may feel, you matter and you are loved and you make the world a better place to live in. Um, so I just ask that everyone on council and the community keep that at top of mind throughout the week and thank you. Thank you, Council Member Hall for sharing that. I have a couple of little uh, items to provide. Upcoming council meetings, city council regular meetings will continue to occur as scheduled using, this rem using a remote meeting platform. The next regular meeting will be held on June 1st at 7 p.m. Council study sessions will also begin again remotely in June. The next study session will be held on June 9th at 6.30 p.m. And certain boards and commissions will meet remotely in June on an as-needed basis. The Re Recovery Task Force will continue meeting remotely on the second and fourth Tuesday of each month. Um, there is no executive session happening uh, as part of this meeting, but there was one conducted earlier at 6.30 uh, during a special council meeting this, this, this evening. And there being no further business, uh, this meeting is adjourned at 9.52. Thank you all very much. <laughs>